on an all-new Dr. Phil. Dave was cheating on me with the woman half his age. He met at a strip club. It was like Tarzan, swinging from one vine to the other. Is this a marriage? You were vulnerable to the affections from another woman. I ate it up like a bowl of happy soup. Or a melodrama. She tried to run me over. I wasn't trying to run him over. Did you cut up her underwear and set it on fire? I might have. Just tell me you ate me. Why did he torture me? Let's do it. Is a safe place to talk about hard things. Stand by. We'll count you down. I'll try to be an emotional compass and point you in the right direction. Five, four. I am not giving up on you. It was June 12th of 2012 when I received a letter from a 16-year-old Alyssa about her dad cheating on her mother with an exotic dancer. She said he was her hero until he made a mess of the whole family. Then her mom wrote to me, heartbroken and wanting advice, that was followed by another email in October of 2015 from her 75-year-old grandmother, Jean, who then sent five more letters pleading for help. Three women spanning three generations are begging to fix their broken family after a devastating affair. It all began when Stacy got a call from a woman who said she was sleeping with her husband, Dave. That's when she says her world fell apart. She went from a comfortable life in a beautiful home, custom built by her husband, being lavished with designer shoes and bags and family vacations at the shore, to being forced to move into a two bedroom apartment with her six children. Now Stacy's husband Dave claims he turned to his exotic dancer mistress because there was nothing exotic going on in his marriage. Stacy says Dave is just a selfish liar who has strung her along for years now. One minute saying he loves her, the next minute declaring he will never leave his exotic lover. 23 years into our happy marriage, we were an awesome family. I was blindsided when I found out Dave was cheating on me with a woman half his age. She was 28, Dave was 45. I always called her a stripper whore because he met her at a strip club. She is the nastiest, meanest pig I've ever met in my life. I found out about the affair because she called me, not because you told me. I wasn't trying to hide everything from you. I just screamed. I wanted to kill him. The police came and told him to leave. That was the beginning of seven years of hell that we've been going through. I realized this relationship wasn't going to end. I moved my six kids into a two-bedroom apartment. Dave and I never got divorced. He would call me all the time, begging me to take him back. But meanwhile, he had a house with this girl. He was lying to her and lying to me. That's not drama. I want to know the truth. Dave was waging emotional warfare on me. He would tell me how much he loved me. He was so sorry for what he did. But he would call me names like, whore, you slut, you're so ugly. Right now, my life is in total disarray and ended up moving back in with Dave. We've been living together with our 12-year-old daughter. Dave claims his relationship with the stripper is over, but I know it's not over. I'm not really sure if this could even work with Dave or if I should just move on with my life. Dave says he knows he hurt Stacy, but he has no regrets about the affair. Dave claims he feels like Tarzan swinging from vine to vine between Stacy and the other woman. Eight years ago, I did meet this girl at an exotic bar. I struck up a relationship. She just filled the void in my life that I've always wanted and my wife didn't fill. This sex with a new girl was more than I ever thought could happen in life. It was the greatest. I hurt Stacy, and it kills me to death, but do I regret it? No. I've had some of the best times in my life. The person that I am now is the real me. I purchased a motorcycle for myself to have some fun with. 
Stacy felt very betrayed. There was a lot of times she wanted to see me burn in hell. Since we broke up, I know Stacy's been with roughly 30 men, and that's that's pretty hard to handle. I don't know if she's trying to hurt me, but it's pretty disturbing. But for the last eight years, I never really shut the door on the relationship I had with Stacy. I would talk to Stacy and then basically torture this other girl because I was flip flopping. I was like Tarzan, swinging from one vine to the other, but I wouldn't let go. Right now, my ex girlfriend and I have broken up, but still talk at times. He's not being honest with me about his ex girlfriend. I keep catching him. I do love Stacy. Sometimes I just wonder if we're hanging on something that is just hopeless. Are, are you two living together right now? Yes. I moved back up here uh, in December from Florida with my boyfriend. My boyfriend ended up hanging himself at my son's house, so I went to his house. Your boyfriend hung himself. We're going to circle back to that later. Uh, I'm sorry for your loss. Thank you. Can I say one little thing? Yes. And I don't mean this as anything derogatory or anything, but, like, I, I like watching different TV shows and movies. I love movies. I always hated when I would watch a, a court trial, and they'd have the person on the stand, and the lawyer would let them talk, and they would be saying a sentence that they wanted to get the whole sentence out, but the lawyer would stop them, like, right halfway through the sentence, and it would change the whole thing of it. It would just twist it out. If they could say the whole sentence, it would be much clearer. Well, just coming in from backstage and seeing the initial beginning of this show, mm -hmm. it's really a picture that's painted that's very... Well, what's the... I mean, I don't know. It just didn't well, seem no, to... No, the floor is yours. Is there some picture that's not clear? There's a lot, you of, got there's the a lot of truth to be told. It makes, it makes, it makes my wife there look like nothing but a victim and it makes no, me it painted it way. painted a One picture bit. there of me being like maybe the worst guy in the world to your well you've got the floor the show, here David. you paint the picture here's the brush you paint if you go back and look i was a very dedicated husband for 27 years i was a dedicated father all i did was work and take care i was at every one of my kids games i taught my kids a lot i loved being with my kids i took care of my wife i tried to give her everything she ever wanted and basically, all I wanted and was I just a little love did. in return. I mean, I feel like there's people, there's two types of people in the world in, in one category, and it's there's givers and takers. And I felt like I'm a giver, and I've been giving my whole life. I just wanted a little bit in return. Mm -hmm. And I believe my wife is nothing but a taker. And all of a sudden, I met somebody that was one of the nicest givers in the world and showed me the love that I was waiting for my whole life. <laughs> whoa, whoa, no. He wanted the floor. You have the floor. I used to talk to my wife. I used to pull her aside. Like, I turned a, I turned a house that was that we bought. We lived in a couple different houses. Every time we bought a house, I fixed it up. We sold it for a little bit of a profit. We finally got a house that was going to be condemned by the township and torn down. It was a frat house. We took the house and we turned it into a five bedrooms, three and a half baths. It was like a beautiful home. I did it just to give her like everything she ever wanted. Like I did the worst thing a married man could do. I know that. And I didn't mean to fall in love, but I did. Well, let me see if I understand. So you feel like you were a dedicated father and a committed husband. You provided a good home and you did well by your wife and your children. But she withheld affection. She withheld love. And in a love-starved way, you finally were vulnerable to somebody that would give you what she withheld from you. I was, I was given and given to her, to my well, kids, nonstop. And, and my love tank was empty. That was exactly. a question. Uh, yes, yes, I feel like... So do I get it? You, you get it 100%. Okay. And so finally you just said, well, I, you know, I'm going to get it somewhere. When you say get it, I don't know what love. you mean by that, but I mean, well, I no. wasn't going after just it. Like, no, love, attention, affection from another woman because you weren't getting it at home. Absolutely. I ate it up like a bowl of happy soup. Stacy says Dave tried to choke her and threatened to kill her. But Dave says Stacy is the one who instigated the fights, not him. We'll talk about that when we come back. He tried to cut you up and leave you in the basement floor? Yes. She tried to run me over. I'd have no legs if I didn't jump out of the way. I wasn't trying to run him over. And later... 
Why do you torture me? Just tell me you hate me. Tell me you don't want to be with me. Because I can't take it anymore. Tomorrow on an all-new Dr. Phil. I hate you. Terrorized by their team. You have an out-of-control young man. They punched my dad in the nose. Tearing up the house. He ripped the phone right out of my hands. I don't have... He's 15, and you're still whipping him with a belt. I get so frustrated. So you're hitting him for you, not him. He didn't want to come on stage. He's a little bit nervous. But his story has to be told. That's tomorrow. There have been times where I've been very afraid of Dave. I got a little bit of an anger problem. When he gets angry, he explodes like a lunatic. He did get physically abusive with me. One time, he came up and grabbed me around the neck and started squeezing my neck and said he was going to kill me. We finally let go. He pulled out a knife, and he said, I'm going to slice you up all over this basement floor. Before he left, he told me, if you call the cops, I will come back and kill you. So I did not call the cops. I was scared to death. Well, Stacy says her ex-husband's affair with an exotic dancer destroyed the picture-perfect life they had created for their family of six children. But Dave says, oh, wait a minute. It was not picture-perfect. It might have been picture-perfect for her, but he says it was not picture-perfect for him. He says his wife neglected him, and eventually, he says, I finally broke and fell to the affections of someone else. So y'all are still married, though, right? Yes. Did he threaten you with a knife? Yes. Did he threaten to cut you up and leave you in the basement floor? Yes. Did, did you pull a knife on her? No. Did you threaten to cut her up and leave her in the basement floor? Uh, at that night, I think I was drinking. I don't know if I said anything scary like that, but I, she knows I would never lay a hand on her. She knows I would never do nothing like our that. Our daughter was hysterical crying, jumping on him, saying, please, Daddy, you said you love Mommy. Why would you want to hurt her? I, well, I was drinking, and I went over, and I said, why can't you just wake up Take me back and we'll fix this. But he was living with the girlfriend. This is when I was girlfriend. living at the house taking care of the kids and I found out yeah, she was you, back dating her you, high school you got, sweetheart. You got drunk and threatened to chop her up, right? I said something probably to that. I'm effect. sorry? I might have said something to that. Effect. I'm not saying you meant it, but you threatened to chop her up. Uh, I mean, come you gotta on. got to get rid of the evidence on me. I don't, <laughs> I don't know. No, I mean, come on. I mean, you, you probably Did said Did I say that? that? I don't know. I was drinking. Yeah, so you probably said... I don't know if I said it. I didn't have a knife. Look, she's laughing in her bottle. She knows... No, because it's, it's true, and you know it's true. Did he have drinking. a knife? He had, yeah. Always he always carries a, a knife. Like... He's a carpenter. He always had a knife in his pocket. And he pulled it out. And he, oh, I had got new implants, out. like, when we were still married, after the six kids. And he goes, I will slice this off. And whoa, whoa. So I'm sorry. And cut you all up. <laughs> I'm sorry. Cut you all up. So... Um, and I said, and he goes, and if you call the cops, I will come back and kill you. Did, did you say that? No. Call the cops, I'll come back and kill you? No. Listen, uh, I, I'm, a busy, I'm a busy guy. <laughs> and seriously, mm -hmm. if, if you, you got to, you can't come in here and lie. Well, you, no. You, okay, but behaviors are discreet. They have a beginning and an end. They either occur or they don't. Right. Some things, it's like, you like this picture, you either do or you don't. You know, that's an opinion. But whether something happened or didn't, it either happened or it didn't. Okay. And there are some things that kind of pop out against the background of life. And pulling a knife and saying you're going to chop somebody up and leave them in the basement floor, that that's is, one of those things that kind of pops out against yeah, the, and it, against and the wallpaper of your life. I, I mean, so for a fact. That either happened or it didn't. It so happened. It, when one of you says yes, one of you says no, somebody's lying. I swear to God. In the scheme of this whole thing, that's this big. It sounds pretty bad, but... Well, I'm, listen, I'm not just signing a, a, a weight or valence to it. I'm just trying to find out when somebody says yes and the other person says no. I'm just trying to find out who's telling me the truth and who's not. I'm not saying you were going to cut her up with a knife. I'm just trying to say what happened or didn't. You would do a lot better with yourself to do a modified mea culpa and said, yeah, I shot my mouth off, but I didn't mean it, than to lie and say you didn't do it if you did. I, I don't right. want you to say you did if you didn't, but I don't want you to say you didn't if you did. I just want you to tell me the truth. The truth is, I was drinking. I went over, was begging her to take me back. She didn't. I remember putting my hand right here. Not real bad. She got scared, acted like, you know. And my, I said, my daughter, and I said, oh, what am I doing? I was drinking. I made a bad call. But would I ever pull a knife and tell her I was chopping her up? I don't know if I said something to that effect, but 
would never do it, and she knows that. Well, you might have said it, but you would never do it. Right. Okay. All right. I don't know if she wants to bring up the time that she tried to run me over. I'd have no legs if I didn't jump out of the way. And she took the car and ran right under the back of my pickup. Does that happen? Yes, that's it. But I wasn't trying to run him over and cut off his legs. He but was I good. did try to slam his truck, and I, want, I slammed it a couple times because yeah, I caught him lying again. again about his girlfriend and making a fool out of me for the 10 millionth time. So you were going to run him over but not cut his legs off? I did not want to no. His truck was in front of me, and he stepped in between, and I stopped. I wasn't even, didn't even touch his body. And then he the walked the away. Car. I jumped out of the way. You were not. I and then I slammed in his truck, put it back in reverse, slammed in his truck again because his truck was like his heaven. And I was like, really? You're going to keep lying to me, David? Okay. The women it wasn't like, right. Women like that, like but... a man over a teeth, right? <laughs> women like that? <laughs> My truck treated me better in 25 years than she ever did. Oh, really? 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 Taking care of six kids and a grandchild, doing all the wash, cooking, cleaning every day? Oh, okay. I didn't help take care of any of them people, really. Yeah, okay. Well, up next, she wrote to me when she was just 16. One of Stacy and Dave's daughters says her dad's affair ruined their lives. Well, she's of age now, so we're going to talk to her. She's here. We'll meet her next. When I was 12 years old, my mom included me in all the decals of this affair. Over the past seven years, I've moved 19 times. I had to drop out of school. I took all of it out of my father, and I actually destroyed the windows of his house and his truck. He has a black belt. You say he tried to gouge your eye out. Gouge her eye? She's had bruises. I don't try and hurt you. I just try and stop you from doing anything to me. She's charging you like a bull? Is that what you're saying? And you're having to take her down? There, yeah. She's ready to marry a stranger. And now cops show up at her door. I'm terrified that my grandma's going to go to jail. You won't believe the twist in this alleged catfish story. Where is this mystery man? We found him. He's here today. A convicted hospital worker. I saw Jameson committing a sexual act with his patient. What he's saying is wrong. She grabbed a hold of my shirt and pulled me towards her. Could this have happened the way he said? Absolutely not. But did you actually see the sex act taking place? From homemaker... My mom is a party mom. ...to divorced with two DUIs. 100 miles an hour with the cops chasing her. Slammed into a wall. It's enough to drive anybody crazy. You're saying I'm not sure why they have the opinion of me being a party girl? Maybe it's because you're a party girl. My children know a lot about the violence and the craziness that has gone on between Dave and I. You dragged our kids into this way too much. I know Our kids did. should not know a quarter of what no, they know. No, I know they do. I am definitely guilty of it, and I feel horrible. I definitely did use the kids to punish Dave. Stacy and Dave's daughter, Alyssa, says her dad's affair with an exotic dancer destroyed her mother. She claims her family's life was turned upside down by her father's selfish betrayal. Before the affair, I was my daddy's little girl. When I was 12 years old, my mom included me in all the details of this affair. I don't believe that I was old enough to deal with that. Looking back now, I'm kind of mad at my mom for doing that to me. I knew my life was going to change at that point. Over the past seven years, I've moved 19 times. I felt like I had chaos and instability in my life from moving so many times, and I had to drop out of school. I was a very angry teenager. I took all of it out of my father. When I was 14, I actually went to his house and destroyed the windows of his house and his truck. My dad expresses anger and rage towards my mother. I'm very worried about my little sister who is witnessing all this insanity that goes on at the house. She's 12 years old. The moral of the story is my dad wants to be with the mother of his children, but he wants to change my mom into somebody that she's not. It would be great if they could work this out, but I just think there's too much damage Done. So, I'm glad to meet you. 
I'm sorry that you've been pulled into the middle of this. You said that your dad has come over to the house and says he had a gun? Yes. Or he had a gun? He said he had a gun. He was in the back of our apartment building where we were living at, saying that he was going to kill himself, and hopefully somebody throws him in the dumpster that he's sitting in front of. He was in front of a dumpster? Yes. He's going to kill himself. Hopefully somebody will throw him in the dumpster? Yes. You heard that? Yes. You heard that? That was when we, I moved with all the kids into a two-bedroom apartment. Yeah. Did you say that? I don't remember that one, but <laughs> I honestly don't remember that. Well, you gave me a really detailed longitudinal history of 27 years of fatherhood and rebuilding a house and describing the different bones of the house and its history and all that kind of stuff which demonstrated a really good memory but you don't remember standing in front of a dumpster he doesn't with a remember gun? anything that he's done no i don't he says remember he forgets the bad incident. things I, I went through a tough time when i realized that my whole life fell apart you know what i mean in my family i was devastated what i did to my kids it tends to do that if you start dating strippers while you're married what did you think would happen uh, at the time, I wasn't thinking. I lost my business. I started not being able to provide for my family. It made me feel like a loser. You know, I felt horrible. I wasn't producing. She comes home. She would start shoplifting. She's telling me, I have to shoplift. You don't make enough money. Oh, oh, I yeah. did. Oh, Well, let's okay. get into that. Let's get into that. That's not I, what this is about. It's not what it's yeah, about. Yeah, and You're I right. didn't come home and say I had it's a shoplift. It's about me being a horrible no, person. It's about, no, it's about both my parents who should wake up and take care of their kids that they still have. It's true, and, and that's what I want to do. That's what I want to do. I want to get help to figure out how to raise my 12 year old now i've been doing it for and a year and a half and two years and i want well, you, you take because we ask you why you had the affair you said you lost your business you, you felt the only thing you ever did was work and pay bills you felt lonely and unappreciated you, you felt that stacy took the kids sides and isolated you out that you didn't have a best friend anymore you couldn't get hug kiss foot or back rub you had a higher sex drive and you always had to beg for sex you wanted affection you got nothing from her but he could have got it from his kids well the, the love of your children is a lot different than a spouse or a part <laughs> i loved all my kids okay kids. but i shouldn't have to beg you until this day to stop talking to her you shouldn't be talking to her before, the, before show. the show no today before the show on the phone with her you can't help where you're Hardest. You should help that you love your kids and you should stop doing this to us. And I do want to love my kids. Um, okay, are you, so you're still in a relationship with this woman? No. Will you talk to her before the show today? I've talked to her. Today? Today she called me, begged me not to be on the show. I told her to stop texting my husband that she needs to move on. And she said, I will never leave your husband she in. sent he you loves a, me she sent you a text this is what she wrote to you yes she says stacy knock it off dave has been texting me in florida this whole time he's just not your husband anymore he's my best friend why don't you go bring another man to go hang yourself and kill yourself to get away from you what type of sick person she's a Why sweet person like huh I don't like all this text, and I think this world's a mess with cell phones and Facebook. And oh, so that, that, that makes every excuse in the world for her to say something like that to your wife. And you tell me how much you love me. I said me. that's wrong. I'm not going to say that's right. That's so wrong. why are you still talking to her? <laughs> okay, we're going to find out what happened no. when Dave's okay. girlfriend announced that Dave friend. just became a father friend. to his seventh child. <laughs> Did you cut up her underwear and set it on fire? Yeah, I got I got a little ticked off. I used to tell her, yeah, Yo, you're smoking hot. Why don't you wear a thong once in a while? I don't know how we got six kids. Because it's granny panties and T-shirts. Next Thursday. Tell me what happened tonight that Chrissy went into the coma. The last time viewers saw Nick Gordon. I miss Chrissy and Whitney so much. <laughs> Dr. Phil sent him to rehab. Bobby Christina Brown, the daughter of the late music legend Whitney Houston, has died. Now, 
The autopsy results are in, and Nick Gordon sits down to look Dr. Phil in the eye. I want to give you a chance to set the record straight. The questions everyone wants answered. Did you murder Bobby Christina Brand? Only on Dr. Phil. Closed captioning provided by... My bladder leakage made me feel like I couldn't be the father that I wanted to be. Now I use Depend, I can move the way I really want. Unlike the bargain brand, new Depend Fit Flex underwear is now more flexible to move with you. Reconnect with the life you've been missing. Get a free sample at Depend.com. The power of OxyClean is now in a laundry detergent. One cap beats four caps of the leading value brand to remove tough stains better for brilliant whites and vivid brights. Try OxyClean HD laundry detergent today. Save up to 20% versus the leading brand. Dave would come into my house when I wasn't home, and he would sneak into my bedroom searching for things. Took all my thongs and bras and cut them up and burned them outside in the yard. I'd be like, are you kidding? What is wrong with you? You're sick. And he would say, well, if I can't have you, no other man's going to see you in your underwear and bra. Stacy says Dave's affair not only broke her, it caused her kids to go on a downward spiral. Dave claims his family was far from perfect, and Stacy is the one who abandoned the kids. She abandoned the kids. Several times. How, how so? Just would take off. Take off out drinking with times? her boyfriends. And take why? Off to Florida. Because the it was all my fault. Everything was my fault. She would leave because... Twice. Twice. Okay, what else? Because you would not stop torturing me. Okay. And would not pay child support. Would not help me a dime. Why am I paying child children. support when I had the kids most of the time? Oh, what you happened? did. For the first couple months when you left, I didn't see you for almost we two didn't years. We didn't for you for how long? Two years. You said I was like a ticking time bomb. Oh, because you didn't want to come, come around me. That's why. Because Maybe the way you, you treated me and the things that you would say oh, to me. Oh, because your mom would let you go drinking. Your mom would let you step I started away, sleep doing over. that because I was so damaged there was because no, of what there you was no, okay. There was no discipline. It's a pretty big mess. It's a real big mess. <laughs> did you did you cut up all of her underwear and put her set on fire? <laughs> um, you don't remember that either? I remember. <laughs> oh, shut up. I don't like the <laughs> did, did you cut up her underwear and set it on fire? I might have. <laughs> Because when we were married, I used to tell her, yo, you're smoking hot. Why don't you wear a thong once in a while? Why don't you wear some, a negligee? Why don't you wear matching bra and panties? I don't know. I'm sorry. I'm visual. I like that stuff. And then she never wore. With me, I don't know how we got six kids because it's granny panties and T-shirts. <laughs> All of a sudden, she gets out on the town, and, oh. man, Victoria's oh. Secret was like, whew, her new shopping spot. Man, she had I every... I think so. Got the boobs done and got everything. No, so she's out done flaunting When we were still married, David. Mm. Yeah, I got I got a little ticked off. I wouldn't hurt her, but I cut her. But pants. you know, he was still living with the girlfriend. What is wrong with you? <laughs> You're horrible. Huh? That's horrible. I wish I never killed you. Look. I wish I never killed you. You're saying you wish you all this. So you don't want to fix our family. I want to fix our family, but I never wanted your mom to change for me. You never wanted what? I don't want her to have to change who she is. I mean, she's a great woman. She's a great person. You don't need... You, when, you, when you love somebody, you shouldn't have to feel like you have to change you know, somebody. You know what I mean? Like, I don't want her to change. Well, I was okay love, for I want, 25 I want years of marriage, back. wasn't I, David? You were okay. Until you I met her okay. in a strip club. No. How yes. can you say that? Until you met your it friends that had a different lifestyle than right. you and you wanted until that. You, so. Until your friends that you started riding your motorcycles with who didn't have kids were They married, loved me, and I loved myself for having six kids and being married for so long. I don't know why you think that. And you can even... Well, like, did I'd you love have to get a all seventh, six of my buddies here that I ride with. Did you have a you. seventh child? Did I have a seventh child? No. Hmm. I went down and helped this girl that I was involved with give birth to a baby. Because she told you that it was your child. Did she tell you it was? No, she never came out and said that she yeah, maybe she, she said, said she didn't it was. know. She didn't think it was. But he had a vasectomy. Yeah. Uh, because you wanted me to. Then I had it reversed because she wanted a baby. 
Like, anything she wanted, she got. So your boyfriend hung himself at your son's apartment? Mm hmm Because we came up from Florida in December, uh, December 16th, because I wanted to be with the kids. And I came home, I went to pick her up from school, I was going 45 minutes, came back and saw him hanging in the uh, kitchen doorway. Was this a surprise? Mm-hmm. Total. You, you had, he had no not, idea. No, he had not been despondent. He had not no. given you any signs None or indication. None whatsoever. I we were it was actually the staying with Lissa the I first two weeks. I thought it was the third weeks. time he tried to do it. No, that was years ago. We were actually staying with Alyssa, and Alyssa met him. She knew there was he was happy, good, lucky, nothing. He wasn't a drug addict. I was shocked. He was an addict for years, but he was not doing wasn't drugs. Wasn't he stealing all your time. pills off? Not at the time, no, he wasn't. So your 12-year-old actually... She didn't see him hanging. She saw the bottom of his feet that were turned under, and I pushed her into the bedroom and said, because I knew right away. And she automatically called 911, and I said, don't come out of this room. I ran, I cut him down, tried to give him CPR, and then the paramedics came. But she definitely has issues from this. So where do we go from here? Because there are children involved, uh, which is the reason that I agreed to do this story. Uh, we'll be right back. My daughter, Stacy, she is an absolute mess, and she's so low and broken. Her husband has tortured her. I beg you to please help. My family is a mess, and I would really appreciate it if you could help us. I just would love if I could get my family back together and to be one again. My family, one of the most loving, caring, blessed families in the world. Hopefully you can help our family, and thank you, and God bless. Well, Stacy says after 23 years of what she believed to be a happy marriage, she was devastated to learn that Dave was carrying on an affair with an exotic dancer. Dave says he did turn to another woman because Stacy never showed him any affection. He says he knows it wasn't the right thing to do, a uh, bad choice, but it's water under the bridge. That's what happened and it is what it is. One of the questions that y'all have is, should you reconcile this relationship? Well, because he always tells me how much he loves me, like, one day, and then I believe him because I thought we always had a good marriage. And then the next day I find out he's telling the girlfriend how much he hates me and I'm a whore and this and that, and, and he's gonna telling her he's going to marry her. And I'm like, why do you just keep hurting me? Like, just stop. Like, it will just end it and... Move on, but stop playing games with my heart all the time. Because I can't take it anymore. I don't know what to do. I mean, it is true, you know, the way I feel about her. And I just, I don't know how anything can be fixed. You know? And then I, mean, I say, I why do you want to be back with me if you still keep talking to this girl? Why do you torture me? Just tell me you hate me. Tell me you don't want to be with me. But just let me go then. Like, because... Uh, it's just making me crazy. I wouldn't say those things. I wouldn't tell her. I wouldn't. I wasn't trying to let her go. I do have those feelings. I do want to take care of her. I do love my children. I just wanted to be happy, too. I just wanted to be loved myself. I mean, just a little bit of affection. I don't need all that. You know, I don't need... If I did the sexual things and praised him nonstop, I'd be the perfect wife. Praise me nonstop. Like, I need praise Or tell nonstop. him how good so. he looks or... That outfit looks so cute on look you. I think I look good. I don't think I look good. That's not what I wanted. I just wanted a little bit of caring. That's all. Okay. D do you do you want to be in a relationship with her? I don't think it's possible. I don't know what I want. I just want to be happy, and I want my kids to be happy, and I want her to be happy. Well, and my I don't dog want her to wants have to, to be happy. What do you what, what do you mean? What do you want? What what or, do you know what you want? If I you don't, that's married. okay. I love being married. I want. I'm a one woman guy. And. <laughs> Uh, well, uh, come on. I believe I Why? Because I went out of my marriage? Well... I didn't go out of my marriage. I mean, 30, 30 men? 
I think we have to 30 women. I wasn't with 30 men, David. I don't. You don't know what you want. Do you at okay. least want your kids to be okay? Again? I want my kids to be okay. Well, then so stop to make my kids to her. okay, should I just be alone the rest of my life? Is that No, but you need to worry about yourself and make sure that you're okay and your 12 year old's okay, and then you can find somebody and to be okay. What have I been doing for the last two years? Look, let's take a break, come back, and I'm going to tell these two exactly what I think needs to happen. We'll be right back. in the Los Angeles area and you would like free tickets, go to drphil.com and click on Be in the Audience. Or you can call 323-461-PHIL. That's 323-461-7445. Should the two of you get back together? Absolutely, unequivocally, no. Um, neither one of you at this point is capable of sustaining a, a healthy relationship. Because when you come into a relationship, you bring with you history. And you either contribute or contaminate that relationship based on what you bring into it. And right now, you would contaminate any relationship mm -hmm. that you're in. You have bitterness and resentment and confusion and immaturity. And you would contaminate any relationship that you go into. You have the same things that she have. You're very immature in terms of relationships. You say, I don't know what I want, because you're very hedonistic. You want what you want when you want it, and you want it right now. And so you've gotten yourself into a pickle. And this relationship that you have with this girlfriend, the chance of that ever working out for you long term is statistically somewhere less than 1%. Wow. I mean, it, relationships that are born out of the history that this one is born out of, less than 1%. It's not going to work. If this relationship is going to work, you have to first do a relationship autopsy. You have to go back and figure out why it didn't work the first time. Mm -hmm. You've got so much history here, and both of you are so immature that you, you turn to alcohol, drugs, violence, threats, name-calling, destruction of property, slashing tires, smashing windows, writing on cars. To, you even said, I use the kids to punish him. You, you, even, you even know no, it. I you know even know wrong. that you're using the kids as pawns. And it's terrible. And I mean, that is so destructive for the children. The two of you are going to have to get your act together. The two of you are going to have to sit down and be willing to take a serious look at yourself and say, what is it about me that I cannot sustain a healthy, positive relationship with anyone in my life? You can't do it with your children. You can't do it with each other. You obviously can't do it with any other adult romantic relationships or you wouldn't be in this situation. You cannot handle a relationship. Captioning provided by. No junk food, please. Go for the Trumu! It's delicious! And nutritious with no artificial growth hormones. Trumu, a truly good thing. Want to know what's coming up on Dr. Phil? Visit our website and subscribe to our email newsletter. You'll get weekly updates, life strategies, and exclusive video that you won't find anywhere else. Plus, on drphil.com, you can see sneak previews of upcoming shows. Log on today. Let's talk about one thing for sure. You have one child that the two of you need to parent that's 12 years old. Yes. You have other children that you need to reparent. Yes. Uh, because not one of them has had 
a smooth and productive trajectory through this life. And it's not too late to stand before your children as a mature, united front and say, you know what? We're really sorry because we have modeled for you emotional chaos. And we are going... <clears throat> And we are going to stop that, and we are going to fix that. And we are, we are going to show you that lives can turn around because we want to model for you how to turn your lives around. Because your kids are headed for a hellish existence if you don't do it. They need a father figure. This situation needs you to step up and be the hero. Needs you to step up and man up and be the hero here. And you have, you have the qualities to do that if you will just get some things out of your way. You keep getting in your own way. You're both behaving in impulsive, erratic, chaotic ways. And And that has to calm down. And to do that, you're going to need some real ongoing professional help. And then this family, as a unit, is going to need some ongoing professional help. And I am, as a gift from me to you and this family, I will provide that for you. I'm going to ask you to go to a program called Onsite in Nashville, Tennessee. And Onsite is, is a worldwide leader in really intensive workshops that are custom designed for people that have been through trauma, for people that have been through chaos in their lives, for creating a, a, a plan for their life and for their family. So I want you to work on some things individually, and then I'm willing to send you to on-site in Nashville, Tennessee, and, and have you work there intensively to give you a jump start on this. Will you take this help? Yes, thank you. I want you to man up and do this, okay? Thank you. All right, I want to thank my guests today, and a special thanks to on-site and Miles Adcox for helping this family. We will see you next time. All right, guys, we're going to start on this right away. I'm going to get this set up right away. All right, thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. We did the first ever televised intervention live right here on this stage. We've conducted dozens of interventions since then. Today's show is unlike any we've ever done before. Today on an all new Dr. Phil. Hi. She's a college professor. Wow. Woo. Did you lose your shoes along the way? With a serious problem. Have you had much to drink today? Point one, three, four. Yeah. I'm over the legal limit. I'm never going to stop drinking, so that's the, what next subject. This is the guest. Robin! I go like Robin more than you. You don't want to miss. My drinking is 10% me, 95% others. When my mom's drinking, she's physically violent. How would you? Do not hit him. I dare you. After 170 days in jail. Has she hit you in the face? Don't even go there. You're oh, out of control. 57 911 call. Do you call 911 when you're lonesome? Never. One unless there's a fatality. You're yeah, invited to my 50th birthday party. Next subject. And eight rehabs. I am not going to a dumb treatment center. Put this on the air. Hello. Her daughters want to disown her. I've cut off ties with her. I can't do this anymore. I am done. Bye. Now, you are at the precipice. This is a threshold, and you need to say, I need to listen to this man and do what he is offering for myself and for my family, or you are going to die and maybe kill somebody else along the way. Will she accept the help? That's awesome. Where's the next drinky? Let's do it. Have a good show, everybody. Here we go. This 
is a safe place to talk about hard things. Stand by. We'll count you down. I'll try to be an emotional compass and point you in the right direction. Five, four. I am not giving up on you. I'd like for you to meet Treva, former United States Department of Defense employee. She's currently a university adjunct professor. She has a master's degree. She teaches graduate level courses in the field of information security management and project management. In addition, Treva has been married to her husband Vern for 22 years. They have two beautiful daughters, Morgan and Ashley. But her daughters say their mother, who on paper has clearly an impressive resume and a cutting edge skill set in her career field, has been verbally abusive and drunk for their entire lives. Take a look. I dare you. You got me intoxicated. Do not hit him. Prosecute me. I'm a United States citizen and I can drink if I want. Well, the family, and sometimes even Treva herself, have called 911 so often, a record total of 57 times, that the 911 operators and police know Treva on a first name basis. <laughs> Here are just a few of those calls. Sir, can I have 911? What's the address? Oh, yeah, can I get somebody to come out here? My, oh. my wife is drinking. She's hurting herself? Yeah, knocked the phone out of her hand. She threw the TV down. My mom is really drunk, and she just tried to hit me with a vacuum. Has she been drinking today? Yeah. She's talking about killing herself now. Does she have access to, like, any knives oh, or she's, guns? Or... She's go running for them now. What's going on? My mom just lit the trash bag on fire. She's drinking again. So she's drunk? Yeah. Oh, my God. Yep. Is the house on fire? Do you need the fire department? Yeah, we do. Okay, get out of the house. Well, unbelievable. While Treva has told my producers that she's only 10% of the problem and her family hold 90% of the blame, her daughters say otherwise. Now, she has already spent 170 days in jail for various offenses and has been to eight rehabs in one year. Her daughters estimate Treva drinks 600 liters of rum and vodka. That's enough to fill these eight shopping carts. Morgan and Ashley say, enough is enough. And too much is too much. And they refuse to talk to their mom until she not only gets help, but also makes long-term permanent changes in her life. Take a look. I would describe myself as huge alky. I have a couple drinks a day. When my mom drinks, she just doesn't stop. I dare you. I dare you. She'll either drink rum or vodka. Huge bottle every day. Like really filming me? She'll drink whatever she gets her hands on. Pretty much feel like I'm out of control. My drinking is 10% me, 95% others. When I drink, the truth comes out. When my mom's drinking, she's physically violent. How would you? She has slapped me in the face, broke my glasses. She just broke my glasses. She'll break coffee table railings. One time we're watching Netflix. She went to the TV and threw it down. Once she took a vacuum cleaner and hit me over the head with it. I dare you. She has taken a baseball bat and knocked a hole in the door. One time we were watching American Idol and I was making snacks. I was lighting the candle and it caught the trash bag thing on fire. She set fire to a trash bag and set the house on fire. She just had this really creepy look on her face. They called the popo. I was in jail for 164 days last year. Guess what I got charged with? Dr. Phil. Arson! My mom's very smart. She has a master's degree with honors. Her drinking has progressed where she can't even hold a job. She hasn't worked in over two years. I'm a motivational speaker. I'm a novelist. 
I have several books. Sadly, my mom is an alcoholic, and the alcohol just makes her very delusional. I spoke to Hillary Clinton the other day. I'm very busy with her uh, campaign. She called me herself to thank me for winning Iowa for her. She does not know Hillary Clinton. For years, my mom has tried to get help. I've been to treatment centers, mental hospitals, and I've even been to jail. Treatment centers are dumb. This is circus. I feel like Dr. Phil is my mom's last option. I mean, I'm not in denial on that drinking. I raised my hand. I've drank many a time in my life. I don't think drinking has the, is the issue here. Well, Treva is here, and she's going to join us now. So, Treva, if you will, uh, come on out. Well, have we seen the doctor? Hi. Wow. Woo. How are you, Dr. Phil? Yeah? Have a seat. I got a step for you here, so watch your step. It kind of blends oh. into the floor. Mm -hmm. Did you lose your shoes along the way? <laughs> no. I, I didn't. You just uh, took them off? Yeah. Yeah? So, how do you feel about being You're here? You're a very nice person, by the way. Well, thank you. Yeah. Uh, I've heard people say very nice things about you as well. Who would that be? Well, I mean, your, I said, who would that be? Your husband and your daughters um, find you when you're not drinking or upset to be an I'm amazingly never inspiring be person. Drinking. Yeah, and uh, uh, your daughters. That's, that's your daughters the irony in, in this whole thing. The doc <laughs> your daughters in particular find you to be very inspiring. You're very inspiring. Where's Robin? We know. Robin, she's right out here. Say hi, Robin. Can you Robin, move the boom? Can, come here. Can you come move here, the Robin? boom? Hi. Robin! How are you? Who loves you more than me? I love you. That's Robin. And, um... Thank you. All right. All right. Well, next subject. I don't know what the subject is, do we know? Seriously, do we know what the subject is? Well, the subject, according to you, is a family intervention, and that's what I'm really focused on. I know. What is that? That? Well... Do we know? You, you said that you felt like 90% of this issue was your family, and 10% okay. of it was you. All right, let's, let's go back to inception. All right. I was abused by my family. I'm very sorry to hear that, by the way. Thank you. I, I really am. I'm very sorry to that's hear that. That's what happened. You know, I think that's what started the whole thing. We actually made a list for you of some of the things that you had mentioned. You said you've been punched in the face by your husband, Vern, that you've been strangled I've by I've been him. almost killed by my husband. Do you not know that? Yeah, you, Do that, you understand that he pushed you out that? of a moving car. Duh. That he pushed you down a flight of stairs. Yeah. That you've been pinned down with force by your daughters. And that you've been pushed and shoved by your daughters. I mean, seriously, <clears throat> that is dumb. You know, it's almost like, why and how, how would the, somebody do that to me? You're very intelligent. I know you are. Thank you. And I, I'm pretty sure that, you know, I don't know if you even have uh, an ability to help me because there is, I don't think there's any doctor in the world that can help me. Maybe not even on this planet, maybe not even on the moon. We don't know. Seriously. I'm pretty good. Really? Yeah. Have you had much to drink today? I do like to know who I'm talking to, so I've got a blood alcohol measure here. Ooh, ooh. Keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. Okay. Oh, my. Well, it's probably not accurate. And later... I can't do this anymore. I physically can't. This is our last resort. I'm never going to stop drinking, so that's... The, what Next subject. 
Tomorrow on an all-new Dr. Phil. Their son is 32. You got in my face screaming and yelling. You were really raging. Violent. We walk on eggshells around you because you'll blow up. And still lives at home. They think you're a moocher. I'm not a moocher. If you guys want me out, say so and I'll be out. You say you're bipolar. Is it so debilitating that you can't clean your room? And I told them I didn't want any of that taken. I didn't want any film of it. Listen, if you don't want to deal with the truth, then don't be here. That's tomorrow. Have you had much to drink today? No. No. <laughs> Not much? Well, we don't know. But, you know, give me a BIC. We'll do a... Well, okay. I, I do like to know who I'm talking to, so I've got a blood alcohol measure here. Hang on, hang on. It's got to beep. Yeah, let's and then go ahead. when it beeps, you got to blow on. until it beeps. And uh -huh, when it beeps, okay. you got to blow uh -huh, until uh -huh, it beeps uh -huh. twice. Oh, okay? Oh. All right. All right. Uh -huh. Okay, go. Uh -huh. Blow real hard. Keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. Okay. Oh, my God. It's going to be like a point fifteen thousand. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, we don't know. So we don't know. I, I hope you started in time. Let's see. Shut. It's calculating. Mm -hmm. Well, it's probably not accurate. How old is this thing? We don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Seriously. It's dumb. <laughs> oh, my. It says point one three four. Yay! Well, I'm over the legal limit. Duh. Yeah. That's um, almost double. I arranged for you to see Dr. Bradley Jabor before you ever came to the show here, who's, yeah. in my opinion, the top neurological radiologist in the world. Yeah. You said, is there anybody on the globe that can help you? Well, I think I'm pretty good at what I do, and I know he's damn good at what he does, so I ask, I ask you to see him. Um, and as we move through the show, um, do we have permission to talk about the findings that he came up with? Uh, to use you as a teaching tool for others? Yes, sir. Okay, so it's, it's all right with you if Dr. Jabor shares with me and here on the show the things that he found out about you in, in hopes that it may help us. I would like that for that to happen. Okay. You comfortable with mm -hmm. that, Dr. Jabor? I am. Yeah. Okay, I just wanted to be <clears throat> sure. Um, well, here's what we're going to do. Treva's daughters, Ashley and Morgan, are both here, and they say their mother is a violent, toxic alcoholic who will be dead this year if she doesn't stop drinking. They love her dearly. They are concerned about her greatly. She says that, that they're a big issue here, a big part of this problem. One of her daughters even thinks the only solution for her mother at this point might be jail where she can't drink. Well, we'll find out which daughter said that when we come back and see what they have to say here. My goal is to get this woman some peace, get her safe, get her where she can be happy in her life. We'll be right back. My mom would forget birthdays, really important events. We got to the point where my mom wasn't able to even cook meals for us. Senior year, she told me to kill myself. Everything that my mom has put me through has left me with a lot of insecurities. And later... Well, I'm never going to drink again, I promise. <laughs> I think that would be wonderful, because I know that Do you they... have a drink on you? <laughs> In one week... Tell me what happened the night that Chrissy went into the coma. The last time viewers saw Nick Gordon. I miss Chrissy and Whitney so much. <laughs> Dr. Phil arranged for rehab. Bobby Christina Brown, the daughter of the late music legend Whitney Houston, has died. Now, the autopsy results are in, and Nick Gordon sits down to look Dr. Phil in the eye. I want to give you a chance to set the record straight. The exclusive interview. That's the lowest point in my life right there. When you left money in the will by Whitney, photos surfaced of Chrissy smoking out of a bong and snorting cocaine. Did she have a drug problem? Yeah, it got really bad. Were you a bad influence on her? 
They say he punched her in the face and kicked her to the point she was on the floor screaming and he dragged her up the stairs by her head. And the question everyone wants answered. Did you murder Bobby Christina Brown? Next Thursday on Dr. Phil. My mom, not only does she drink and then go drive, but she drinks while she's driving. My mom's had one DUI, but that certainly not stopped her. I've never gotten behind the wheel under the influence. And she's flat out lying. She's lying. And I never drink and drive. Well, Treva admits that she's an alcoholic who's been oh. drinking heavily Ooh. for over 35 years, but she Stop. claims her drinking is only 10% of the problem. She says the other 90% of the blame goes to her husband, who's right here, this is Vern, and her two daughters, Ashley and Morgan, Where who say they their at? mother Where is a compulsive liar who not only physically attacks them, but also constantly tells them they're fat, worthless, and stupid. Like my mom's drinking has damaged me, and it's left scars. I'm a good mom to my daughters. Growing up, my mom was always drunk. When I was 12, I can remember my mom just being completely passed out drunk. We got to the point where my mom wasn't able to even cook meals for us. My sister and I would have to go down to the neighbors to eat dinner. She would forget birthdays and really important events. My whole life, my mom has always told me that I'm overweight and worthless. My senior year, she told me to kill myself. I do feel like I was a great influence on their life. Dr. Phil because both of them are straight A students. I was an honor student, straight A's, and yet my mom's favorite word for me was stupid. Okay, how long has it been since y'all have seen your mother? Easter. Easter, mm -hmm. so it's been a while. It's and been a while. So where's the breakdown here? I don't know. What is the point? What is the subject? We don't know. Well, I know. What is it? We don't know. The subject is that there's dysfunction in this family. I'm not going to be going to another dumb treatment center. And, and that's another thing I'm going to tell you about. I am not going to a dumb treatment center. Put this on the air. Hello? Uh, well, I wouldn't ask, you to, I wouldn't ask uh, you to go to a dumb treatment center. Seriously. I am done. Woo -hoo. Bye. I think that even though you're almost double the legal limit right now, I still think you have an amazing intellect about you. And I think when you say that through your life you've been abused, I think that leaves really deep and open wounds in a person. And if they're not healed, if somebody doesn't do something to heal that, then those wounds fester and they hurt and they get worse. And the person that's suffering does whatever they can to numb the pain. And they start to self-medicate. They do anything they can. Exactly. And I'm not going to ask you what you think you should do. I'm going to ask you to, to do something with me hypothetically. What, what are you asking, Vern? I'm talking to Robin. Oh, the, Robin. Oh. Would you like Robin up here? Yeah. Robin, would you, yes. would you join us up here, please? Can you bring a stool out for Robin and let her join us up here? So why do you, why do you like Robin? Why do I like Robin? <laughs> What are you guys talking about? I can like Robin more than you. Does that help to have her up here? Because she supports you, I guarantee you. We, we talked about you last night. She's been very concerned about you. Very concerned. Very happy you're here. I think you're in the right place. So why do you why do you like Robin? Why do I like Robin? Yeah. <laughs> what are you guys talking about? I like, like Robin more than you. <laughs> Most people do. <laughs> well, I know 
well, surprised, but, joke, but, but <laughs> what is it? What is it about her that you find comforting? She aspires to help other people, mm -hmm. and that's what I like doing myself. I can't even believe I'm talking to you really seriously. You know, my hope that um, being here today will help solve a problem that you have with your daughters because I know that they're happy to be here uh, and really in hopes that the relationship between you and them can be healed from the torment that happens between the three of you when you're drinking. I know that they... Well, I'm never going to drink again, I promise. <laughs> That's wonderful. I think that... I think that would be wonderful because I know Do that they... Do you have a drink on you? <laughs> no. Seriously. No. No. Joking. No, I know you are. Um, I know seriously. you are. I know you are. You know, their, I know their hope guys, is that. that I don't that they even feel. ever want to drink again in my life. I that would be Promise. wonderful. I, I think that would be wonderful, of course. And I think this is the best place to be if, to get that started. You know, people often start a behavior for one reason mm -hmm. and continue it for another. You know, you, you might have started for one reason, and mm -hmm. then as you got into it, it kind of took over, and now it, it's it's out of control. And these beautiful daughters that love you very much mm -hmm. and that admire you so much are concerned that y you're actually going to wind up dead. And, and let me ask you this. Yes, I, yes, sir. Sometimes it's hard to look at yourself. But if one of your girls was doing something that was so toxic it was going to kill them, mm -hmm. what would you want them to do? As their mother, what would you want them to do? Thank you for asking me that question. Because <laughs> pretty much I would do some kind of intervention myself. What would you want them to do? Would you want them to change that? Absolutely. Would you, okay. would you stand in the door until they did? Yes. Or would you let them self-destruct? No, would you no. let Morgan self-destruct? No. Would you let Ashley self-destruct? And I know they're susceptible because it's in my bloodline. Duh. They drink more than I do. Hello. We all know this. Well, go ahead and... Yeah, we did a BAC. Why don't you do one on them? I can. Okay. Thank you. There you go. Let's do it. Go ahead. <laughs> you know, I, I can... Seriously? Uh, Where is it? My drink. Where's my drink? We need to have a drink. Which one of you would like to go first? Yeah, I'm okay. <laughs> okay, thank you. Oh, how close I hear you. Zero, 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 zero. Let's see this one. Wait till it beeps. Let's go. Why don't you do it? <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you do it, Dr. Phil? Zero, 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 zero. Last drink I took was 45 years ago, so I guarantee you it'll be zero. zero, zero. <laughs> 45 years ago? Yeah. I thought you were only 42. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to take a break. Ashley says her mom, Treva, calls 911 so often the dispatchers know her by name. So if Treva always calls as an emergency oh, victim... Golly. Let's go with that. Why is she the only one who ends up in jail? <laughs> we'll talk about that next. I call 911 when there's a serious problem. I was on stage with Barry Manilow last week. You were on stage with Barry Manilow? She loves to call 911 for a variety of reasons. Is it advisable to have the heat on when you have a... 
Tomorrow on an all-new Dr. Phil. Your son is violent. You were really raging. And still lives at home. You can't clean your room? I told them I didn't want any film of it. If you don't want to deal with the truth, then don't be here. That's tomorrow. I've called 911 several times. A couple times that thought I was dying. What's the address of the emergency? I don't know. Um, I might be dying. When I call 911, I have a legitimate thing to talk to them about. It's not just random, hi, I'm calling 911 because I, I think it's funny. No, I call 911 when there's a serious problem. I don't know if I have Ebola or what. I don't know. I have a virus that's going around. Okay, are you suffering from any of the following? Any body aches? an onset of diarrhea, vomiting, or bloody discharge from your mouth or nose. Not that I'm aware of. She loves to call 911 for a variety of reasons. Is it advisable to have the heat on when you have a fever? I'm sorry, ma'am, I can't give you medical advice over the phone. Did you want a rescue squad? I'm not feeling well. I think it's menopause. Have yes. you been through menopause yet? No. No? Nope. I think it's menopause because I'm sweating like this. She comes up with crazy things. I was on stage with Barry Manilow last week. You were on stage with Barry Manilow? I was. Well, that sounds fun. I feel like a lot of times my mom calls 911 because she's lonely and she just wants someone to talk to. That's crazy. Do you call 911 when you're lonesome? I've never called 911 unless there's a, a fatality. Seriously, Dr. A fatality? Phil. Yeah. So well, when you I just was... called him and invited him to your birthday party. You called him what? and said you had the heater on. That might not be the best I'm use not of it. I'm calling to tell him I'm in my bus. Well, I just, I just heard you say what? that. Yes. That's dumb. Anyway. I just, I just heard you say that. Next subject. Okay, next subject. Uh, according to your daughters, <laughs> they say so whenever dumb. you get drunk, you have hit Vern in the face and smashed his glasses. What are you talking about? That you Seriously. threatened to kill Vern Molly. in his sleep, that you threw Morgan down the ooh, stairs, ooh, ooh, that ooh, you threw ooh. a beer can at Morgan's head, oh, that you golly. attempted to break Morgan's arm. Do you want to pull, pull this back a little bit? That you smashed ooh. the bedroom door with a baseball bat, that you set the kitchen on oh, fire, that, that you were joyriding in two stolen cars that you drink what? while driving, that you've stolen money, spit at family members, that you make fake 911 calls, that you use the racial slurs and the N-word, baboons and monkeys. And those uh, things where, are upsetting where, where to are you guys, right? Where are we going with right? this? The first, oh yeah. Well, okay, we're gonna talk about, uh, where are we going first? I think what hurts me the most is I've, I've cut off ties with her. I can't do this anymore. I physically can't. This is our last resort. Thing. I just can't watch my dad take this anymore. He's suffered the most out of all of us. He's been the most loyal person to her. And I think that's commendable for a husband, but sad for a dad. You know, I've, um, I, I was raised by and lived in a home with an alcoholic father. Robin was raised in and lived in a home with an alcoholic father. Um, and I know that it changes who you are. It impacts your personal truth. It impacts your sense of self-worth. It affects your self-esteem. How has this affected your self-esteem? I have very, very low self-esteem, especially she has called me those bad names, like the worthless and the fat ass, and I've heard that throughout my whole life. It's never stopped. So even now, it affects my dating life. It affects my friends. I don't go out. I'm afraid of what people think of me. You fear being judged. Yeah. And that you can't stand up to the evaluation, right, the assessment absolutely. of others. Yeah. Because of the things she's put in your head. Right. How has this affected you, Morgan? She said the same things that she's told Ashley to me. Um, but I grew up where they were really close. It, it kind of made me more dependent on other people for happiness. Like, I kind of like look for other people to make me feel okay. This is your husband here who's very concerned about you as well. She has hit you a number of times, correct? She has hit you in the face. She has oh, broken I your glasses, never... correct? Yes. 
Has she hit you in the face? Yes, she spit in the face. And has she broken your glasses? Yes. Uh -huh. And she's saying that's not true. <sighs> Dr. Yeah, Phil. It's on the defense, uh, by the way, duh. I don't think she knows right and wrong anymore. Don't even go there, come on. Well, a few weeks ago, Treva sadly lost her mom. Two days before she died, her mother recorded a deathbed wish for Treva. We'll find out about that after the break. My grandmother passed away a few weeks ago. My mom's own mother died telling my mom that she needs to get help. When I think about what my mom had, had told me, I feel like I betrayed her. I can't trust anything that my mom says. I know I can be trusted. I've flown on Air Force One. I've escorted HC, Hillary Clinton, myself. I am like the most trustworthy person in the world. Maybe even the moon. Air Force One? That's a new one. I didn't know she rode on Air Force One. Treva is here with her daughters, Ashley and Morgan, who say they've disowned their alcoholic mom because her drinking, abuse, and violence has destroyed their family. A few weeks ago, Treva sadly lost her mom, I'm very sorry for your loss, and claims that she nearly drank herself to death. Now, in an emotional video, see her mom's dying wishes. My grandmother passed away a few weeks ago. Two days before my mom passed away, she recorded a message for me. My mom's own mother died telling my mom that she needs to get help. I told her many years ago that if she continued to be like this, that I wouldn't leave her a dime. Tell Treva, if she keeps going ahead one foot at a time, she'll get there. When I think about what my mom had told me, I feel like I betrayed her. And I wanted so badly to prove to her that I could do something with myself. As I said earlier, before the show, in order to know what I was dealing with, I ask that you see uh, Dr. Bradley Jabor, the world's leading neuroradiologist with more than 20 years in practice. He's an expert on the impact of alcohol and other uh, intoxicants as well, uh, and trauma on the brain. He met with Treva a few days ago before the show and performed a very sophisticated evaluation on her, including an MRI on Treva's brain at his medical imaging facility. Dr. Jabor, could you join us up here and let's just go to the screen and I would like to explain to uh, Treva and her family. Um, and before How we... How are you? <laughs> good and you, thank you. Oh, I'm good. Uh, before we trigger this, you had a difficult time performing this because she had a difficult time staying still, right? Yeah. <laughs> Shiva was a little disoriented and oh, no. a little bit drunk um, what? when she came. Just a little. What? Um, no. And, but we did get a good scan. So now we can look into the brain and we can see the brain coming through and we move mm -hmm. half the head out and we can look mm -hmm. at the wires in the brain. And the wires, like a computer, are, um, can be damaged by alcohol. So we were able to analyze that. This is Treva's brain on this side and you've compared it to a, a normal brain with no damage or impact on the other side. Tell us what we see red. here. So the red, the red represents good, healthy brain tissue well, working, working yeah. energetically in this, in this side. On, on this side, in Treva, unfortunately, your brain's a bit asleep, mm -hmm. a little bit lazy with spaces, at least 30 to 40 percent less activity than okay. in the normal brain. Okay, yes. all right, and here, Tell us what we're looking at. We can see that her brain has, sh has shrunk down. It's been marinating in all that alcohol, and it's become pickled. And you have too much space around the brain. The white represents fluid around the brain that is shrunk. And now we see that Treva probably has other medical conditions that with the alcoholism, nothing she's not, to do with alcohol. She's not taking care of herself anymore. because she's developing little strokes, little 
holes in the brain from what I believe is uncontrolled high blood pressure. Okay, so what he's telling you here is that there's uncontrolled hypertension. I'm, not, I, I'm never going to stop drinking, so that's the, what next subject. Let's have a seat. Just mm -hmm. take my chair here, if, if you will, for a second. Uh, what I want you to hear here uh, very clearly, and what I want you guys to know, what I want you to understand here, is that what we're talking about here is there are some life-threatening conditions here, and it can't be reversed if you continue to put this toxic poison in, in the brain. show without you, our studio audience. If you are going to be in the Los Angeles area and you would like free tickets, go to drphil.com and click on Be in the Audience. Because we have a lot of fun here, don't we? Or you can call 323-461-PHIL. That's 323-461-7445. What are the biggest dangers to her life at this point? There are basically two. So, uh -huh. so what's happening Listen to what he you? says. Uh, two, you got a race between the alcohol killing you either by continuing to destroy and disorganize your brain mm -hmm. such yes. that you don't even realize that the alcohol is your enemy and you scarring up your liver and the, the veins from your liver ultimately are going to get bigger and your liver cannot stop a blood hemorrhage and you're going to vomit That's up great. blood That'd and you're awesome. going to die from hemoptysis. That would be awesome. Let's go with that. Can so we do that, that, that right is away? what will happen ultimately. Oh, okay. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Woo Let me do that. Let me get that. But Where's the next drinky? Well, Look at me. But you have... I don't really care. You have daughters that do care, and they you don't, don't have... Uh, you don't have... About me. You Does that make sense? No, it doesn't I've never make sense. Had anybody that you don't care have about. the right Hello. to burden them with no, you destroying your own life. To. I'm not going to burden them again. By self I never talk to these by being self destructive. Three musket queers again in you, my life. You don't have happy, you don't have the family. right. I'm you not don't have the right to yeah. burden them with self destruction. You need to hear what I'm saying. You need help emotionally. I don't need any, please you don't send need me help. off to some I'm, weird I'm not going to send place. you off anywhere. Exactly. What I'm telling you is you oh, need uh, help with what's going on inside. Duh. And these girls are entitled to having the oh, peace of mind of exactly. knowing that oh. once in their life their mother decided that she was going to stop doing what she was doing and give it a shot to try and give herself a chance to be healthy one time. That they, they deserve that. They deserve that, and frankly, you owe that to them. And you need to go to a gender. You need to go to a gender-specific dual diagnosis treatment program to deal with your. I know you don't want to, but I'm telling you, you need to. You're out of control. The from this person. Well, this is T.J. Howard right here. He's the corporate director of operations at Origins Behavioral Healthcare. And the Origins Recovery no, Center. Seriously, he knows any place. Well, no, that listen, would help me. here's where I would like no. to send you. I would like to send you yeah. to South Padre Island. No. It offers a sophisticated, gender separate, age specific treatment program for so men and women separate, be, specializing uh, in the treatment not only of addiction and alcoholism, but the psychological issues that you have been carrying in your life. Right. You will never have a better offer than what you've got right now because I am stepping up as a gift to you and your family mm -hmm. and agreeing to send you to what I believe to be the absolute best dual diagnosis treatment program in the entire country. And that needs to happen or you are going to die and maybe kill somebody else along the way. You are at the precipice. This is a threshold and you need to grab hold and say, you know what? I need to get out of my own way, and I need to listen to this man and do what he is offering for me to do for myself and for my family. And you have never had a better offer than you're getting right now. Look me in the eye. Tell me you will do this. I want that. All right. Okay. All right.
A special thanks to all of my guests today, and a special thanks to Dr. Bradley Jabor as well as T.J. Howard from Origins. If you or someone else you know is dealing with alcohol or drug addiction, you need to log on to drphil.com. You tell me about it. You never surrender to the disease. You never surrender to the disease. We'll see you next time. I'm the resource director here at the show. Either she's going to treatment or she's going to die. Let's go have this meeting. Okay. We have it set up for you to go directly from here mm -hmm. to treatment. We have. Uh, I'm not going to treatment. I don't have to accept this. Get the f out of my life. If you really love these two girls, you're leaving and getting on an airplane right now. Please. Come on. Okay, come on, Mom. It took a lot of convincing, but she finally decided to do it. My hopes are that she does recover from this and we can rebuild what we've had. Dr. Phil, their son is 32. You got in my face screaming and yelling. You were really raging. Violent. We walk on eggshells around you because you'll blow up. And still lives at home. They think you're a moocher. I'm not a moocher. If you guys want me out, say so and I'll be out. You say you're bipolar. Is it so debilitating that you can't clean your room? I told them I didn't want any of that taken. I didn't want any film of it. Listen, if you don't want to deal with the truth, then don't be here. Let's do it. Is a safe place to talk about hard things. Stand by. We'll count you down. I'll try to be an emotional compass and point you in the right direction. Five, four. I am not giving up on you. and Gary worked hard their entire lives, all while imagining that by now they would be quietly enjoying their golden years together. But instead, they say their lazy, mooching, 32-year-old son, Jeremy, <laughs> who's never lived away from home and refuses to leave, has ruined any hopes of that. According to Mom Kathy... Jeremy goes days without bathing, rarely leaves the house, spends up to 18 hours a day sleeping in his garbage-strewn room, and says she is the cause of all of his problems and failures. Oh. Kathy says Jeremy blames everyone and everything for why he can't get his life together. He's bipolar, he's depressed, his parents made him this way, and wait for it, the universe dealt him a bad hand. Now, they say they want him out of their house for good so they can move on with their lives and stop living in fear. Take a look. My 32-year-old son, Jeremy, lives at home with his father and I. I want my son to move out, get a place of his own. He just needs to have a life. Right. We can't have a full life because... He's here. To have to support our 32-year-old son, it disgusts me. Jeremy stays in his room. 18 to 20 hours a day. His room is a pigsty. He'll take food, a meal in there to eat, and he'll leave the dishes in there for days. Garbage all over the floor. His bed's never made. It's a disaster. Jeremy did drop out of high school. He did not get a high school diploma. We tried to help him get his GED. He has never really contributed to any of the bills. Even his car will have to give him money for gas. It's really hard to make him do something he really doesn't want to do. Jeremy blames me for the state of his life right now. Jeremy is extremely aggressive. Anything can set him off. He likes to get right in my face and scream at the top of his lungs and his face is purple and he calls me every filthy name in the book. Stupid, he says I don't deserve any respect. He scares me. A couple weeks ago, I said, could you please feed the dogs? He went ballistic. 
He started screaming and yelling at me as if he has a schedule. He acts like he has this invisible schedule. Jeremy kind of lays around the house and doesn't really contribute, doesn't do anything. We can kick him out and he comes back. I am at my wit's end, that's why I'm calling Dr. Phil. He's my last chance, he's my last hope. Huh. <laughs> well, you come to the right place. <laughs> Jeremy says his parents should be glad he lives at home, glad. Because hey, they're getting old. They need somebody around to take care of them. I can't move out of my parents' home right now because I'm not equipped to take care of myself. I blame my mother for some of the choices she's made that's led my life to where it's at. My life is pretty much a monotony. It's the same thing every day. I don't have any hobbies. There is no typical every day for my life. I tend to want to stay in bed a lot. My parents have probably kicked me out throughout the years maybe half a dozen times. I lived in my car. I stayed with friends or cousins. My parents do push my buttons. We tend to butt heads a lot. The thing that sets my anger off the most, they say that I never meet them halfway. I don't feel that's true. I feel it's them never meeting me halfway. If it's not exactly the way you guys think, or it's not in tune with exactly how you guys feel or think everything should go, this is what I have to deal with. You guys control everything. Mom needs to stop yelling and getting so angry first. Because if she's angry, if she I gets scared when I get... That's just a reaction to you. I try to take myself out of the loop as opposed to her. When she gets like that, she seems more combative. She likes to be a little bit more confrontational. She likes to get in everybody's face while me, I try to stay away. I know that at this age I should be a little bit more independent, but parents need me around because I've noticed they're getting older. At some point I'd like to provide and have a family for myself. I haven't really had much of the opportunity to take advantage of things in my life that have come. Everybody's moving by, passing me on. I don't feel it's fair. Okay, this is interesting. They think you're a moocher, are you? No. Not a moocher. I, I've never really heard them call me a moocher, per se. Do you contribute financially? Uh, no, no. I don't really make enough to contribute almost anything financially, no. Do you have a job? Yes, I have a job. What do you do? I work distribution, unloading trucks. 40 hours a week, 30 no. hours a week, 20 hours a week, 10 uh, hours a week? It's very nominal. Uh, now it could be anywhere from 12 to 16 hours a week, maybe. Uh-huh. So it's a part-time job? Yeah, right now, yeah. Uh-huh. And you're how old? 32. 32. And you're, you say you're bipolar. Yes. Because I went through all your records and I went through everything you all provided. I couldn't find a diagnosis of bipolar. Well, I was diagnosed manic depressive at one point, so that's always what I was told. Is it so debilitating that you can't clean your room? Um, sometimes, yeah. Well, that's mean, what I'm asking, like what we're oh, seeing here. So, yeah. I told them I didn't want any of that taken. I didn't want any, any film of it. I told them, yes, I was honest. I was oh, a pigsty well, look, and listen, I, I deal with the truth. If you don't yeah. want to deal with the truth, then don't be here. Because I'm going to talk to them here in a minute. Please do. I'm going to tell them things. Please do. I'm going to ask them questions like I'm asking you. But I help people that want to be helped. And if you don't want to be helped, then don't be here. That's why I'm here. You're not I'd doing like me a favor. Too. But, for instance, uh, the other morning, I came out and expressed that this was moving a little bit fast for me. It blew up to a whole big thing that it didn't need to be to where she ended up calling the police out on me. But why so, did I call them, though? Because you got in my face screaming and yelling. Did I get in your you face? You tried to take the phone away from me. When you were wouldn't trying... Wouldn't let me get on the computer. Was that exactly how it went down? That's exactly how... You're scaring mom. She called me. I had to come home you, from work. You, I know you got you right to work. nose to nose, and you frightened me because you were, you were really raging. Do you know why I started doing that? I realized after I talked to the police officer that you were having a panic okay. attack. I, I want to know why. Well, basically, when I started grabbing the phone, it's because at this time, when I started telling her, because it didn't just come out me going into a rage. When I told her that I wasn't feeling this, it was going way too fast, I'm not liking it, I didn't want to go, she's the one. At that point, I realized she had invested everything into this, so much so that for to her... For you! I understand that. I'm not saying you don't care. I understand that this is for me, but sometimes you need to back off a little bit and see that I need a little, like, this... The time is up, Jeremy. I mean, I mean the time you can't keep up. backing the time up, has been up and me. procrastinating on everything. It's like... Yeah, well, if I had the drive to go any further, I'd really be there, because I don't want to be in this situation any more than you guys do. I don't feel like any... There's no drive, okay? There's, there's no, no reason for me to get up. There's nothing like that. That's one of the reasons why you initially called the show, right? Right. That is why we're Because we've tried everything we can. We don't know where else to go, what and else to do. And you think I do? He... He can help you. We can't. When this all started transpiring around puberty, you guys always started telling me I was lazy and everything. I'm sorry, I didn't have the answers. But you're 32 now. Yeah, I know, but they expect me to already have, like... Well, no, you're 32 now. That yeah. was then. This is now. 
Yeah. Okay, let's take a quick break. Next, Kathy and Gary say they don't know where they went wrong as parents. Well, maybe their daughter Tiffany has something that she can add to this. There's two sides to every story. It's going to be heard. We'll be right back. My parents enable my brother. He's 32 years old. He's never left home. My mom cooks the groceries. It's all here for him. If he needs something, you know, toiletries, it's provided here. They kick him out for like a day. I've said, don't let him back. But they do. And later... I was prepared for you to come at me like that. And they well, can laugh all they want. They're laughing at the ridiculousness exactly. of the situation. they're not sitting they're here laughing. in my chair. Do you want to go down there? Monday on an all-new Dr. Phil. She saw where her grandson was living. Pizza boxes with maggots, bottles with fuzzy mold and nipples. So she became guardian. In two years, you haven't been to see your son? Because I work a lot. Now they want him back. You're saying she tricked you out of the baby. We didn't know that it was permanent custody. Apparently you did. You told your mother. You guys need to go backstage and get your story straight. That's Monday. Jeremy says he's bipolar, depressed, and suffers from a horrific lack of drive for life. His sister Tiffany says he's just using a multitude of excuses as a crutch, and frankly, their parents aren't helping the situation. She says they're as much to blame as he is. I'm 100% fed up with my brother treating my parents the way he does. I don't want to see this cycle continue. My brother's immature. A typical 32-year-old man is not still living at home with no responsibilities. Jeremy's unmotivated, irresponsible, disrespectful. I would never talk to my parents the way he talks to them. My brother can be a taker, and at times he's lazy. It bothers me that he's living here, and even though he doesn't make a lot in his part-time job, he doesn't contribute anything. A normal day for my brother entails getting up whenever he wants to, staying up as late as he wants, eating when he wants, eating as much as he wants here, not cleaning up after himself, going out on cigarette smoke breaks, and being on the computer. He's here, using up the water. He eats them out of house and home. Food's not cheap. My parents enable my brother. He's 32 years old. He's never left home. My mom cooks the groceries. It's all here for him. If he needs something, you know, toiletries, it's provided here. Videos, computer access. I think they need to be stronger and get some tough love. They kick him out for like a day. I've said don't let him back. But they do. These times when he blows up or when he's not contributing and paying his share, like, sorry, real life is you might have to be out. Well, Jeremy's family says he gives him every excuse in the book to explain why he can't get his act together and move out. But are they excuses or are they actually valid reasons? Take a look. Jeremy lives in the world of excuses. He's got an excuse for everything, and he accepts no responsibility for anything. Everything is somebody else's fault. My brother is full of excuses. I do believe he has bipolar disorder, but I think he uses it as a crutch and as an excuse to not move forward with his life. I've got issues that are holding me back. My life is crap, and I think a lot of what it has to do with has to be with those choices they made when I was younger. There's so many excuses, I don't even know if I could count them all. His job was going to offer him a promotion, and he had to take a class for some certification. But he was working at night with his job or the early morning hours. My mom has two little dogs, and they bark, so they would keep him up during the night. That caused him to not pass the class and not get the job. There was about eight days where I was unable to get any sleep. I did not pass because I had actually overslept that day. If his car isn't running because he hasn't maintained it, it's the stupid car. I've been letting Jeremy use my car. Jeremy, please don't smoke in my car. Why are there ashes in my car, Jeremy? Well, they must be on my clothes when I get in the car. It'll make your head want to explode. I get exhausted just listening to him. Well, Tiffany, thank you for joining us. Why do you think your brother's still living at home? No, no 32-year-old guy wants to live at home with his parents. You don't think he wants... He says he doesn't want, want this. He says he doesn't. He doesn't want to live He says there. he doesn't, but his actions show differently. Or lack thereof actions. Inaction is an action. Mm -hmm. You're doing nothing to move forward. I don't want to see you at home with mom and dad forever. 
I don't, I want them to be able to do what they want and not worry about you. When they moved to this new place, they had to worry about... No, they didn't have to, and I told them that. I said, if need be, I would end up th finding my th own way. No. That, yeah, that, how? No? How, how? The, how is that? No, that is exactly what I told you. you I said, if that's where you guys want to go to that other spot that I'm not allowed to be at... You don't have the resources. It doesn't you matter. You don't have anything. Well, they worry about that because they okay, love you. Okay, well, then that's not my fault. It is I because you're them. not moving forward and you're not giving them well, peace of mind. I bought that place outright, so you, when we're gone, if nothing, if, if you're still there... At least you have a place. And I appreciate that. You have a I really place do. to live. I think that that's that's very loving of you, and I'm more than appreciative of that. Which is why, as anytime you guys want anything done over there, I'm willing to help. You know, your right? mom told me one time, I think Jeremy's just going to be with us forever. Yeah. Well. Yeah. And we don't know. Well, what, where is this headed? What, what, what's the what is the outcome here? What what's where are we ten years from now? We'll where, not where be we around ten years from now. What? Might not be around ten years from now. Why would you not be around ten years from now? not really wanting to keep going with this whole lifestyle. Uh, I'm not, I don't know what everybody seems here to think that I'm just in it, trying to sit here. Uh, if, if it was apparent with how unhappy I am, like if I really had the means to get myself going, things would have already been going. There's been setbacks, I've tried everything, but I don't want to be in this, I don't want to be in this position. You, you think I want to be here? I mean, this was, uh, this Jeremy, was the hardest thing for me to come here today. All of us. You keep saying how horrible it is to be here, but Am I like an or something? No, no, <laughs> no, no, not, not no. that. It's just this. The, What's wrong? Why do you we got, we got like four, four. Well, this is a little bit embarrassing, you know, putting all this dirty laundry on TV. But I mean, well, who we, do you know? I mean, I don't know too many people. But either well, way, exactly, this is, I mean, it's this like, is there's embarrassing. Like, there's like there's millions of people watching this. You don't know any of them. There's really no motivation or drive within me. Sometimes I don't want to get out of bed at all. It's very hard to deal with. My parents don't understand, like, when I used to be bedridden, they just said, well, why don't you just get your ass up and do something? Well, that's <laughs> easier said than done, especially when you don't have a motivation for life. You don't really have a want or joy to do anything. It, it takes everything from you. My mom says I have a mental disorder. <laughs> said she ripped the wings off of a pet bird. I did not kill my bird. You little witch. Your children have been removed from the home. I'm in Hollywood right now, so how can I worry about my children? I've been worried about your children. Why don't you take them, then, little witch? Ah! Off before I hit you on stage. They believe a stranger is obsessed with their twin daughters. She took my photos offline and made up a complete lie of her as their mom. My girls are in picture frames all over her house. How did hundreds of pictures of their twins get on your Facebook page? I honestly don't know. You're a damn liar. You've claimed my girls as your own girls, and it's gonna frickin' stop. He was a major league pitcher. Now his family says he's a drunk. You've been self-medicating with alcohol because your dream got ripped from you. I'm not a drunkard. This is that bottom of the ninth, man. You got to do this. Jeremy's anger is getting worse as he gets older. When Jeremy gets angry, he gets in my face. He likes to get really, really close to me because he knows that, that it intimidates me and frightens me. He blames me. I am a trigger for Jeremy. His mood swings are a puzzle to us. One day he could be one of these rages. We're no good. We don't know what we're doing. He screams and yells. And then the next day it might be over and he wakes up and, hi, Mom, I love you, Mom. Like, almost like it didn't happen. To me, it's like a very bad domestic abuse situation, only it's mother and son. My greatest fear is that I'm getting older and weaker, and Jeremy's young and strong, and I'm afraid he might kill me. All these things I'm now seeing on the camera, none of you guys have expressed any of this I to me openly. And I, no. We walk on eggshells around you because you'll blow up, and why I don't confront yeah, you, you do is because you live with no, mom, and you I guys have to protect up. them. Jeremy, you, you do blow up. Years past when have when I, I ever hurt you guys? No. Have I ever? We don't, but you, you blow up. You and I up. used to go at it full tilt. I don't do it anymore because I'm trying to defuse your rage. I, even when I don't give it back to you, you don't defuse. You, you just get worse. It's, it's like you don't have an off And I'm scared of you, Jeremy. I'm scared older. Of when and that's, what I'm, and that's what I'm worried about. When me. you're at home with mom and their own, when dad and I are at work, and and it's I've always, always when always he's been gone. Yeah, but when you I'm scare her. If you guys want me out, say so and I'll be out. No. 
That's that's We've all done there is that to before. It. We don't want to work. throw you out on the street. We want you to. We want to help you move on with your life. Funny here. You don't get well, that? No, I do get that. The, the good news is. <laughs> There is good news here. This, the good news for you is this is not a Jeremy problem. This is a family problem. Right. That's why we're all and, here. And what you are is the squeaky wheel. You also blow up and you, you yell and scream and, and scare her. And I know she does the same thing and she argues with you, but you're a 32-year-old man. You don't scream at a woman like that. That's not okay. I don't care whether you live at home or you don't live at home. That's not okay. I don't care. So, and you do that, correct? Sometimes, yes. Yeah, that's not all right. You need to stop doing that. I, I, I know what's wrong with him. I know how to fix his issue. That's low-hanging fruit. I, I know how to change this. <laughs> Seriously, that's a, that's a fixable problem. What I don't get is what the hell is wrong with you people? <laughs> really? I, I really don't understand what is wrong with you. you well, we don't either. That's why we're You here. were going to move sure into a retirement place, and you didn't because you couldn't take him with you? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because we didn't know what would happen to him. We didn't want him to be out on the streets with no... They won't do the tough love. They will with not do no it. means of support. I knew you were going to say that to us, and I was prepared for you to come at me like that. And they well, can laugh all they want, no, but if they were in our situation, I want to see which one of those mothers wouldn't do the same thing. I, maybe there's some of you that would do tough love and throw your kids out, they, you but I want to see them. how... You know, I don't know that. Talk to me, not them. Know, they don't get a but vote. But they're laughing. They're laughing at the ridiculousness exactly. of the situation. Because they're not sitting they're here laughing. in my chair. Do you want to go down there? No. Then, then talk to me. I am talking y to you. Y'all talk. You, I, we go through tens of thousands of letters. You kick, fight, scratch to get here and then complain about the no. chair. No, no, no. no, no. Not no, at we're all. Not. This guy does not want to be in the situation he's no, he in. No, he doesn't. He doesn't want to be. If you, do you not think he would like to be making a good income, living in a nice apartment with a good car and a couple of girls on the line? Of course he would. <laughs> no. He, he doesn't want to be living with his mother and dad, for God's sakes. He wants what you want for him. He just doesn't know how to get there. Inertia is a tendency for bodies at rest to remain at rest. Right. So he's stuck in this situation. You want out of this, right? Yeah. It, it, but oh, take a break. <laughs> Coming up, Kathy says that... Kathy and Gary say Jeremy is the reason they were forced to give up their dream home and move into a mobile home. I say that is bizarre. I, I don't get that. So what are we going to do? We're going to talk about that when we come back. When we decided to downsize, we originally were looking for a retirement community 55 plus. You couldn't bring Jeremy. Thursday. Nick Gordon returns. Well, you left money in the will by Whitney. Photos surfaced of Chrissy smoking out of a bong and snorting cocaine. Did she have a drug problem? Yeah, it got really bad. Were you a bad influence on her? They say he punched her in the face and kicked her to the point she was on the floor screaming and you dragged her up the stairs by her head. And the one question everyone wants answered. Did you murder Bobby Christina Brown? That's Thursday. On our 25th wedding anniversary, we went to Las Vegas. He brought homeless people in, a woman and her kids walking by the house. They slept on my brand new furniture, I found out. Some guy was there. He had a, a gun in his backpack, and Jeremy was in his room most of the time. So they were roaming around our home. He didn't see anything wrong with that. Jeremy, let me, let me ask you, and I got the same questions for you. What do you want? A purpose and a family. Uh -huh. And by purpose, what would that... Something to give me drive, something to motivate me. And when we talked to you, you've, you did blame choices your parents made earlier in your life, and really even... Up until somewhat recently. Uh, until recently, on your parents. Mm -hmm. Do you want my input here? Sure. 
you know, this is the first show in the history of television that's ever been completely devoted to psychological issues and family functioning and all of that. It's the first time anybody's ever done that. And lo and behold, it's a number one show. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> so I put this down because I wanted you to see it. Because when you see it, sometimes it has an effect. Like you say, this is your words. These aren't our words. These are your words. Well, to some extent, yeah. I'm, I'm re reading them now, and some of them aren't, aren't all that accurate. That's just the way they ended up making them concise. Okay. Okay. No life goals or motivation. And you say a big problem is the bipolar and depression. And that is a factor. I don't disagree with that one. That is a factor, and it needs to be managed. And if that's the case, then we're going to work on that. Thank you. Has to live at home because you frankly can't afford to live somewhere else. Correct. That's shorthand, but yeah. okay. Right. You stopped counseling for depression because you didn't like the counselor, the last yeah. one that you saw. Uh, that was, that might have been a long time ago. The first one we saw, okay. but no, that wasn't the case. <laughs> okay. You stopped yeah. prescription meds because they didn't work. Correct. Okay. You can't leave the house because you don't have a car. You can't go out job hunting because you don't have good transportation. No, my, my car actually runs. The thing is, is I have problems with the rotors and brakes to where they don't want me driving it because they, th they feel it's unsafe, which is why, in turn, they let me use their car. You can't drive an unsafe car, Gary. Why can't I drive it? Because it's unsafe. unsafe. Says you, but I'm the one who drives it. You're the one who says it's unsafe because it makes a little noise. Who doesn't okay. drive a car that okay. makes you noise? You, you quit jobs because you felt overworked? No, there was a job in question that they're probably referencing that to, to where I had worked 13 days. This was a long, long time ago. This was one of the second, I think the second job I had when I was a busboy. I had worked like 13 straight days or whatever towards the end, and I was pretty much, yeah, I got, I got fed up with them. Okay, no girlfriend in 10 years because your mom kind of wrapped that one well, up for you. That's not the reason why I haven't had it because she ruined the relationship. I just haven't had a girlfriend in 10 years. That's not because she ruined the last one, though. Okay, can't contribute financially because you work limited hours. Correct. How about getting a, different, a, a second job? Well, I haven't. That's the motivation factor I'm lacking. I haven't really wanted to look. The last time I tried looking for work, it took me quite a few years to find something. In the meantime, I was taking care of my grandmother at that time, which okay, is. Okay, really remember up there. what he just said. Okay. Okay. Can't get a job making more money because mom's fault he didn't finish school. Again, that's not really accurate. The, the reason I had a promotion that was almost set up for me where I was taking classes for a certification, she had just recently lost her job and was depressed at the time. There's a little bit more backstory to it. She wouldn't get up answering the door. There were family members coming by to check on her. They're knocking on the door, loud as can be. You're right in the living room watching TV, but oblivious to the door. The dogs are barking. You're still not getting up saying anything. I'd have about 10 minutes sitting there listening to this while I'm trying to rest that I'd finally just get up, you know, a little bit, like, angry and say, you know what, answer the door. But then at that point, I can't go back to sleep. What time of day was that? During middle of the day. During the day. People come to houses. Right. During the but day. if she's it home, well, don't, don't act surprised. It doesn't matter. She's home. I'm okay. supposed to be trying to but sleep. But I got you the got... backstory now. You said you failed the job placement test because your mom's dog was barking that's and disturbed your about. sleep before the test. That, yeah, that's, that's actually what I was referring to. The yeah. Whole time. But it wasn't, it wasn't just that cut and dry. That makes it look like it's just some asinine thing, but that wasn't the case at all. Oh, my God. Did you just say what I thought you said? Did you just say that? I did. Monday on an all-new Dr. Phil. She's disgusted with where her grandson was living. Maggots, bottles with fuzzy mold. It wasn't that nasty. Do you think those pictures were staged? I do. Oh, my God. That's Monday. You can't move out because they need you at home. Well, they kind of do now here and there. They, they, there's a lot of work that needs Could to be you done on the place. Please give him permission <laughs> to not be responsible for you too. Yeah, Jeremy, you don't have to be at home. Okay, I'm not saying I have to. You're be. There. I said I would leave, but you guys do kind of need me there if you want a lot of that repair work. No, then. <clears throat> I can do that. No. Or you can come over and help. Oh, my God. Did you just say what I thought you said? <laughs> Did you just mitigate what I said? He thinks he needs to be... The reason that he's staying at home is because he thinks you need him to fix things around the house. No, and I said, give him permission that he doesn't need to be there. And you said, no, you don't need to be there. Well, you could come over and fix stuff. <laughs> Holy... <laughs> Thank you.
Did you just say that? I did. We want him to have a life of his own. Apparently not. You see why we need your help, Dr. Phil. Life is a mess oh, because boy. universe dealt a bad hand, can't control anger because parents won't listen, blows up at mom because she loves sister more than him. And Jeremy, do you really believe that last one? That I love no, sister. No, but I do feel well, she's kind of got. Why did you say something like that? She has kind of got a little bit more of the opportunity. No, she and it's took hard. advantage of the opportunity. Because she's the perfect child. Her, yes, we understand that. She's not that. perfect. None of us are perfect. Somewhere we went wrong, and we don't know where. We where, don't know what. We don't know where. Listening. Somewhere. Some, we don't know what happened. We went wrong. We don't know where. Maybe trying to put me in the same path she went. To motivate you to make something We're out of yourself. We're two completely different people. At what point do you become accountable? I'm always accountable. I tell them if they want me out, all they got to do is tell me, and I will go. He does I, say that, but we don't know how he'll support himself. That's why we're here, because they won't. No, they have before. No, and they don't let you stay out. Well, yeah. Try living we on your own your for 11 help. months. Desperately. When you don't have the means to? <clears throat> I made decisions to not get myself right. in that position. Mm -hmm. When you're gone, Jeremy, if when that happens, yes, that's real privilege, then your huh? mom is fretting. Where, where is he? What's happening? That's not my concern, is then, both? is it? No, I'm talking about your mom. <clears throat> that's why, you know, I always give in. Because I don't tell eat, that... I don't sleep, I'm sick. I make myself sick. Mm -hmm. I, know, I know I'm enabling, I know I'm wrong. I, I, I need... And she can't stand I it. I need your help. So. I can't... I know a lot of it is my fault. I understand that. I just don't know what to do. If, I, if we make him leave as we have in times past, I can't make it stick because She's he's out on the street. That something's gonna I'm happen terrified to him. something bad's going to happen to him. Do, do you threaten him with that? No, I don't threaten him with that, but I mean... At well, you just made a veiled threat a few minutes ago. It's emotional extortion. Maybe so, but that's, that's really... That's manipulative. I mean, you made a okay, veil. Well, you said, well, I may not even be here. And you have said that to me yeah, numerous that times. that was one of the reasons you really started going on the show, because I do feel that way. I don't have a drive. I don't, I don't feel any... I don't know where to go with anything. I don't know how to get my first foot forward. I don't know what to do. I'm, I'm at a complete loss. I'm going to tell these people the truth as I see it, and we'll see who wants to make a change and who doesn't. We'll be right back. Do you need Dr. Phil's help? Text Phil to 88500 and share your story for a chance to appear on the show. Standard message and data rates may apply. We have a lot of fun here in the studio audience. If you're going to be in the Los Angeles area and you would like free tickets, go to drphil.com and click Be in the Audience, or you can call 323 461 Phil. That's 323-461-7445. Look, Jeremy, your, your parents are not perfect. Um, but you're not a perfect son. <laughs> Far from it. That has kind of a symmetry to it, doesn't it? Yeah. L listen, Kathy, Gary, I want you to do something for me. Both of you come with me. Now, you see this? It starts at zero. Mm -hmm. And think about this as your life timeline. God. And I want you to come stand on your age. Oh, in front of everybody? Yeah. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Stand on your age. Okay. You uh, happy now? Right. I want you to look over your shoulder and see how much is behind you. Wow. Quite a bit. Now look how much is ahead of you. Yeah. Well, hopefully it'll go past the end of that. Yeah, hopefully, my ass, this is... <laughs> this That's is life right. expectancy. I don't like this. Got it. Now, you want to spend this the way you're spending it now? No. No. Not at all. Think about this. That's it. That's behind you. That's ahead of you. Burn this in your brain. Because you don't want to be down here saying, you know, that day we went on Dr. Phil, he tried to tell us, don't waste this, and we didn't listen. Okay.
Let me make these wonderful years. You've earned them. That's what I see. That's what I'm worried about. I know. So let's make a change. Okay. Please. Let's make a change. Are you willing to work with us on making this change? Of course. I wouldn't be here if I wasn't. Because I want to get you the help that you need. I want to get you a life coach. Oh my. I want to get you a therapist. I want to get you evaluated biochemically, <laughs> neurologically, to see exactly where you are. That's our gift to you. Let's find <laughs> out where we are. I'm going to suggest that we start with you going to a place that I love called Onsite. And it's in Tennessee. And I've, I've talked to Miles Adcox about this. Onsite is a trusted resource for very intense interventions and, and workshops on getting people really focused on action plans to mobilize their life. So let's do it. Fair enough? I'm all for it. And we'll be behind that? Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. All right. All right, a special thanks to OnSite because I talked to Miles about this. When we come back, why a very successful model and entrepreneur wandered the streets of New York City for 17 hours. Was she really lost or was there something else going on? We'll hear her story after the break. Ready to get real? Go to DrPhil.com for advice on relationships, parenting, finances, and more. Plus, weigh in on your favorite episodes, share your stories, and find support in the Dr. Phil community. When you sign up for the community, you will automatically be subscribed to the Dr. Phil Show newsletter. Log on to DrPhil.com today. My next guest is a well-known supermodel, celebrity chef, restaurateur, and lifestyle expert. Nothing slipped by her until one day the news came. She was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. With the help of her husband, Dan, she is determined to stay happy. Here's her story. If you have Alzheimer's, it doesn't just go away. Um, uh, it's a tough. But, you know, it's tough, but it's not the worst thing that can happen. You expect and always think that the person will operate at their zenith. Especially B, who has the ability to do so many different things over the course of her life. In the beginning, when it was, you know, starting to happen with me, I, I didn't get it. I have a true rock. <laughs> My best friend. When you think about Alzheimer's, you've got to put a line in the sand and make a difference. I am believing the, the one rule. If it could help one person, then it's worthwhile. Well, joining me is B. Smith, her husband, Dan, along with my good friend, Dr. Frida Lewis-Hall, Chief Medical Officer of Pfizer. So welcome, everyone. Thank you. Uh, this is my new best friend. Well, she's, <laughs> let me tell you, she is our best friend as well. We just love it when she is here. So, B, what is the most difficult thing for you in your daily life? The most difficult in my daily life? Um, I have a tendency of sometimes doing a little too much. <laughs> and Sweetie yeah. has a problem at times, she, you know, remembering things which is right. part of uh, the journey that we're on. Dr. Freer, what does it mean when you're diagnosed with Alzheimer's? Being diagnosed with Alzheimer's means you've been diagnosed with the most common form of dementia that you're likely to experience, as Dan mentioned, memory loss, uh, loss of thinking and language ability, changes in personality and mood, and that that is severe enough that it has an impact on your ability to manage your daily tasks. It also means that you've been diagnosed with a disease that is both progressive and irreversible. Mm -hmm. Are there things that trigger this? We really don't understand the cause completely yet. What we 
do believe was that genetics is at play, and we believe that because we know that people who have parents or siblings with Alzheimer's, they're more likely to get it. Yeah. Are there other risk factors besides the genetics? There are two major risk factors. The first is age, and the second is gender. So if you take 85-year-olds, for example, one in three persons at that age have Alzheimer's. Oh, really? And the risk is higher for women, about two-thirds of the people that have Alzheimer's are women. Is that right? Yes. What's been the scariest moment? The scariest moment for, for me was a normal bus trip that my wife would take from our home into Manhattan, and she got off the stop before the last stop before I would meet her. And for 17 hours, she walked up and down the streets of Manhattan in 35-plus degree weather while it was raining, sleeting, and snowing. Wow. Unbelievable. Doctor, what are some of the warning signs? Memory loss and personality changes, poor judgment, forgetting things, asking the same questions over and over and over again. Will you see mood changes as well? Many times you see mood changes and what we call mood lability, feeling happy at one moment and then changing very quickly. Well, being a caregiver certainly can be tough. So what should people in that role do? So caregiving is, is really tough. So the first thing is keep tapping into courage, to faith, to love, mm -hmm. to patience. A lot of times caregivers feel that they should do everything and they feel guilty if they don't. Yes. They have to take care of themselves. That is so very important. Ask others around them for help. That's critical. And then the third thing, make sure you stay on top of new advances Absolutely. Um, in the disease around uh, new research, new management, new resources. All of those things are important to really mm -hmm. uh, stay in pace with. And, of course, we say that there's a good start to get that information on gethealthystayhealthy.com. I want to add one other thing because we didn't really talk about this. We have to have people more aware. We have to have people involved in clinical trials. It's really important. I just want to congratulate them for picking that up on top of everything else that Thank they're you. dealing with. Dr. Phil, I've learned people need to talk to people, that getting advice or counseling or therapy is not something to, to shy away from or to be shunned. That's what Alzheimer's is for many people. The only way that we can make this thing go away is by talking about it and not being ashamed mm -hmm. of something you have no control over. Yeah. And B, you're completely comfortable talking about it, right? I am. Um, I'm not quite sure why, yeah. but um, for, for years, you know, I've done all the things that I'm doing now. Right. And uh, I still want to go out and help. and help other people. Yeah. And I've, I'm, I'm still doing it. Yeah. Well, you two wrote a book about your true love, family, dedication, yes. and hope. And it's creating awareness of Alzheimer's with the goal to one day beat this deadly disease. We can, and we will. And uh, we want everyone in the audience to get a chance to read it for themselves. It's called Before I Forget. And everyone in the audience is going to go home with a copy of um, Dan's book. So congratulations on that, and thank you for taking the time to do that. And you should be really proud of this book, B. I I mean, am. I, I really I hope am. you are. I really hope you are. Um, I want to thank all of my guests today, especially Dr. Frida Lewis-Hall. We'll see you next time. And thanks so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. boxes with maggots, bottles with fuzzy mold in the nipples. How do you have an infant in those conditions? It wasn't that nasty. Do you think those pictures were staged? I do. Oh, my God. You took the baby and left the state. Yes. 
him and Sam showed up with police and SWAT to get Conrad. She became guardian. In two years, you haven't been to see your son? Because I worked a lot. Now they want their child back. You're saying she tricked you out of the baby. We didn't know that it was permanent custody. Apparently you did. You told your mother. You guys need to go backstage and get your story straight. Let's do it. Have a good show, everybody. Here we go. This is a safe place to talk about hard things. Stand by. We'll count you down. I'll try to be an emotional compass and point you in the right direction. Five, four. I am not giving up on you. Conrad was an adorable baby boy with sparkling brown eyes, an adorable smile, and a playful personality. So what kind of parents would allow a precious child to be raised surrounded by maggots, moldy baby bottles, dirty dishes, and beer cans right next to his bassinet? Well, Kim, the baby's grandmother, says those kind of parents do exist and sadly, in this instance, she says they're her son and his fiance, Shannon. Take a look. My son, Sam, and his so-called fiance, Shannon, they're unfit, ill-equipped, negligent parents, and it's been that way since Conrad was born. Sam and I are not unfit parents. If we were unfit parents, we wouldn't have our daughters. I don't think Shannon had any interest in being a mother. When I first had him, I was barely 18. I didn't know how to vote, let alone be a mom. Shannon was doing everything she could for Conrad, and so was I. He's thirsty, too. Look at him. He's really thirsty. Over and over again, I saw things that made me question Sam and Shannon's ability to raise my grandson. I would go over to their place, and there would be dishes with mold, empty pizza boxes with maggots, garbage bags stacked up. There would be nasty diapers, bottles that were full of fuzzy mold in the nipples. It was disgusting. I had postpartum anxiety at the time. It was hard to connect with Conrad. It made it difficult to clean and even just get up to take a shower because I was constantly full of anxiety. Every time I picked Conrad up, I had to immediately give him a bath. He was dirty. He was smelling of urine. He was smelling of spoiled milk. He had dirt underneath his little toenails. One day after I picked him up, I changed his diaper and noticed bruises on his tailbone. It was right in this area, and it kind of like curved around a little bit, I guess. I've never physically abused Conrad, ever. It was actually a birthmark. It had been there since he was born. Shannon was irresponsible and uncaring about the welfare of her child. Well, Kim claims not only were they raising her grandson in a pigsty, but their relationship was so volatile that she was forced to step in and take drastic action using a SWAT team to protect him from his own parents. Sam and Shannon, they were constantly fighting, breaking up, getting back together, and poor little Conrad was stuck in the middle of all of it. Sam and I fought a lot back then, and we admit that. One night, Sam called me and said that Shannon was trying to leave and take Conrad with her to a battered women's shelter. I begged her not to go to come and stay with me, but instead she flew to Kansas where her mother lives. My son immediately filed for an order of protection and drove 600 miles to Kansas. With the help of police and a SWAT team, my son and I got Conrad back. Shannon returned to Illinois within the week and she and Sam were back together again. I was furious. Because of the instability and volatility in their relationship, DCFS suggested that I obtain guardianship of Conrad. You're like Superman! So I contacted an attorney. After all of that, Kim convinced us to sign over guardianship to her or Conrad would end up in foster care. When we signed that agreement, we didn't really read it through because we trusted her. I was able to get permanent guardianship within about 30 days. We thought that once we were on our feet that it would be a temporary solution and we would be able to get him back once we were ready. She tricked us. She saw the opportunity to have another baby and she took it. Well, Shannon and Sam claim that Kim tricked them into signing guardianship of baby Conrad over to her 
when he was just six months old. Trick them. Now, they say for the past four and a half years, she's been raising him 600 miles from where they live and claim Kim is holding their child hostage and will not return him unless they meet what they call her outrageous demands. In a nutshell, Kim hates me and I hate her just as much. A month after I had Conrad, Kim tried to control every aspect of me being a mom. I felt like someone needed to step up and take care of this innocent baby. And if that meant I was being controlling and overbearing, then so be it. She attacked my parenting style. She didn't like the diapers I used. She would come over and bathe Conrad because she said that I wasn't capable of doing it right. She told me that I wasn't able to breastfeed him. She said that my breasts were too small to breastfeed. This is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. Kim was constantly butting into our lives. She would show up to our house unannounced. If she came in and she saw that the dishes weren't clean, Kim would threaten to evict us. Kim said that our relationship was garbage, but Kim didn't help because she was always stirring up drama. She had neighbors watching the apartment to let Sam know if I had people over. This always started fights. He always was questioning whether or not I was faithful because of it. The night that Kim and Sam showed up with police and SWAT to get Conrad, I was stunned. It was happening because Kim was angry that I had broken up with Sam. After all of that, Kim convinced us to sign over guardianship to her. Kim took advantage of us. She made sure the situation worked out in her favor. She was proud to say that she wasn't the mama anymore. I resent her more than I've ever resented anybody in my life. I don't ever, ever, ever want to see Kim again. You guys say that this woman tricked you into signing away your child at yes. six months of age. Yes. yes. And now is holding this child hostage unless and until you meet some outrageous formula that she's come up with before she gives him back. So she tricked you into it, is holding him hostage, pending some outrageous hill that you have to climb that would be virtually impossible to climb. Basically, yes. But now, weren't you telling us, and I, I listened to it on tape, weren't you telling us that, in fact, you didn't think you were a good mother at the time? I didn't think that I was ready or knew what I was doing. I was 600 miles away from my mom, so I was basically lost on how to take care of a baby. Okay, so that's a yes. Mm -hmm. You, you, you said you were suffering from postpartum anxiety. Yes. Not depression. Right. But anxiety. Yeah. And you couldn't get off the couch. You weren't motivated. You, you weren't taking care of the baby. No, he was taking care of his everything else that I didn't take care of. She you had a problem with, you know, keeping dishes clean and things like that. So you agree, when we're looking at the pictures of the crummy housekeeping and the mold and the, the, this kind of thing. You said you were taking care of the baby, but nothing else. This is the nothing else, right? Yes, but there wasn't mold and stuff all over the house. Well, I'm not all over the house, but there are pictures of mold here. Right. Yeah. There's stuff growing that there is was, not agricultural. There was plenty of mold in that house before we got there. Yeah, though. there was mold in that house before we got there. This was not the kind of environment that if Child Protective Services came over and did a home study, they would go, oh, good job. Probably not. They Probably would look not. at that and go, oh, come on. Probably mm -hmm. not. Right? You're right. And, all, and to your credit, you recognized that, that you were behind the curve. Mm -hmm. And you said, can you help us here temporarily? Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't that she kidnapped the child, absconded with the child. You actually asked her to take the baby. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, all right, next. Kim says Shannon never wanted to be a mother. In fact, Kim says when Shannon was pregnant, she smoked, drank, and beat on her own stomach, possibly to cause a miscarriage. Did that happen? Is that what was going on? We'll talk about that when we come back, and we'll hear from Kim. Throughout her entire pregnancy, she did not want to have that baby. Sam told me that during one bite, Shannon was beating on her stomach, trying to, I would assume, miscarry. I never tried to hurt my unborn child while I was pregnant. Kim made that up. 
tomorrow on an all-new Dr. Phil. Human remains found in a recycling bin. Accused of killing a mother of three. I remember saying to myself, I'm not surprised. His ex-girlfriend speaks out. You say he choked you. The exclusive interview. He left behind a blanket. My daughter sleeps with that blanket. The shocking photo. Do you know that's the only time he ever put on your yes. undergarments? Plus, she stared serial killer Ted Bundy in the eye. He said, I'm going to kill you. That's tomorrow. It's been two years now since Sam has seen his son. Sam and Shannon have never sent a birthday card, a Christmas card, a phone call on his birthday, not a gift. There's been nothing like that. Kim does everything she possibly can to make sure that we are unable to bond. She won't let me video chat with him. Kim made a stipulation that we have to visit Conrad once a month. We live 600 plus miles away. It's incredibly difficult to visit once a month. There has been a few times where we've made the trip to go see him and she didn't allow it at all. I've never turned down a visit. Kim is trying to make it difficult for me. She purposefully sabotages my relationship with Conrad. Well, Shannon actually wrote to me because she says her future mother-in-law stole her son when he was just a baby and refuses to give him back. We've actually talked about that, and I don't think he actually stole him, although that's how it was kind of characterized. Kim says Shannon doesn't deserve to raise him because she's been an uninvolved mother who, when she was pregnant, talked about taking a hanger and ending her baby's life. Shannon was a horrible mother even before she gave birth to that little boy. Throughout her pregnancy, it was abundantly clear to me that Shannon did not want to have this baby. On several occasions, she said that she didn't want to be a mother and she was going to give up all parental rights to Conrad. She never actually wanted me to have Conrad. The whole adoption process was actually her idea. On one occasion, Sam told me that Shannon said she was just going to get a coat hanger and be done with it. During one fight, Shannon was beating on her stomach, trying to, I would assume, miscarry. It was scary that she could do something like that. I never tried to hurt my unborn child while I was pregnant. Shannon was a heavy smoker. She smoked a pack a day or more throughout her entire pregnancy. I was working really hard to quit, but I was not smoking a lot at all. Kim made that up. In Shannon's third trimester, I took her to the doctor for an ultrasound. It showed that Shannon's placenta was dying. The doctor told her if she didn't quit smoking, she would deliver prematurely. An emergency C-section was performed. When Conrad was born, Shannon loved the attention that she was getting, but had absolutely no interest in that baby. She's exaggerating. On the day that Conrad was born, I was going through a lot. His birth was sudden. I was only 37 weeks. And then Kim and my sister were in a feud over who got to be in the delivery room. I was really anxious. Shannon wasn't engaged then, and five years later, nothing has changed. Nothing. Okay, so <clears throat> you're saying it's been two years since Sam has seen Correct, the, last... the, the child? Correct. It was two years on January 24th. Did you take this child and move 600 miles away? I did not. Well, who moved 600 miles away? Sam and Shannon. So y'all are saying it's difficult to see the baby because there's a 600-mile distance, but you're the ones that move 600 miles away? We moved 600 miles away because we actually have support in Kansas, and we have no problem visiting monthly. We have no problem spending that money. The problem we have is not knowing if we're going to actually get to see him. But it's you two who moved away from the baby, not her right. that took the baby and moved away from you. You put the 600-mile gap in there. Right? Yes. Has she blocked you from being able to see the baby? Yes. That's okay. not true. Well, yes. here yes, are is. some yeah. text messages yeah, between is. Shannon and Kim regarding visitation. Shannon, so I can see him the 25th, the 27th, then April 23rd and 4th, and then May 28th and 9th? Kim... That's Easter weekend. We have plans. Shannon, of course. So when don't you, Kim, at this time, given your history visiting and the wide spectrum of things you've said in the past 72 hours, I'm not comfortable subjecting Conrad to a visit or two for you to disappear again. Shannon, that's what I thought. Never denied you visitation? Kim. 
it is my job to protect him from harm, both physical and emotional. You have no idea what your crap has done to him. You have never asked and clearly do not care. So you don't encourage vis visitation. Dr. Feld, that particular conversation was after a conversation that we had on February 23rd where Shannon suggested that she was going to, she didn't suggest it, she stated that she was going to contact an attorney and terminate her parental rights. That's not what I said. And asked me if I was ready to adopt him. What did you say? I said that we needed to come to some form of permanency for him because we've been doing all of this for almost five years now. Did you not say you're going to contact, you were considering contacting the attorney? I said I was considering it because I want some permanency for him. I would prefer that permanency was with me, but it's not about me. So when you say that to me and then a week later you say you want to see him three weeks in a row, That's of not course I'm going to, row. or three different weekends, and given your history of popping in for a visit and then not coming, not hearing from you for six months or a year. Why have you not seen him for two years? Because I work a lot. Oh, Sam. If he had some sort of certainty that he was going to get to see Conrad, he'd probably visit more. Probably. I would definitely visit more if I knew I would be able to see him. And, and y'all didn't know that this was permanent? Right. Okay. We're going to talk about that when we come back because I'm having a hard time understanding how this could be confused. And we're also going to meet Shannon's mom, Deanna, who says Kim made abuse allegations in order to gain custody of her grandson. So did she trump this up? Did they think this was temporary? We're going to find out why Deanna says Kim has to control everything around her when we come back. When the police came to my house, it was completely ridiculous. The officers had their vests and their guns, and they were prepared to storm the door. The SWAT team was not at my request. It was absolutely not necessary. My mom says I have a mental disorder. <laughs> you guys said she ripped the wings off of a pet bird. I did not kill my bird. You know what? Your children have been removed from the home. I'm in Hollywood right now, so uh, how can I worry about my children? I've been worried about your children. Why don't you take them then, little witch? Ah! Off before I hit you on stage. They believe a stranger is obsessed with their twin daughters. She took my photos offline and made it a complete lie of her as their mom. My girls are in picture frames all over her house. How did hundreds of pictures of their twins get on your Facebook page? I honestly don't know. You're a damn liar. You've claimed my girls as your own girls, and it's not a freaking stop. He was a major league pitcher. Now his family says he's a drunk. You've been self-medicating with alcohol because your dream got ripped from you. I'm not a drunkard. This is that bottom of the night, man. You got to do this. We're here talking about the custody, the future of a child. Now, Kim says she'll give her grandson back to his parents over her dead body. Shannon's mother, Deanna, says she was there when Kim called a SWAT team to help her extract her grandson from his own mother's arms. Kim says she's not a fan of Deanna and believes she's manipulative, controlling, and a bully. When it comes to Conrad, Kim is extremely manipulative and controlling. Which one's that one? This is really ironic because when Shannon was pregnant with Conrad, Kim said that Shannon couldn't even take care of a baby and even suggested having an abortion. I never would have told Shannon that she should have an abortion. That's not for me to say. Kim has painted Shannon as an abusive, deadbeat mother. This is absolutely not true. If I had ever witnessed Shannon abusing Conrad, I would have called the police and turned Shannon in immediately. I am 100% certain that Shannon abused him. 
Kim used abuse allegations to get the upper hand so that she could get custody of Conrad. When the police came to my house, it was completely ridiculous. There was a whole warrant team to come and take Conrad. The officers had their vests and their guns and they were prepared to storm the door. It was absolutely not necessary. The SWAT team was not at my request. It was standard procedure due to the dangerous nature of the neighborhood. Kim does not want to work towards a reunification or even a visitation plan for Conrad. She dictates where the visitation is, how long the visitation is, who can be at the visitation, and then Kim completely reverses what she's agreed to. That's not even true. They've never maintained any consistent visits whatsoever. It is not fair that Kim controls every aspect. We deserve a life with Conrad. Okay, Dan, thank you for being here. Um, I'm confused a little bit because I think you guys are maybe confused in what you're telling each other. You, you think she manipulated the situation in order to get custody of the child? Yes. Like maybe even trumped up yes. abuse charges? Yeah. So... Did you do... Did you... Trump up? I did not make anything up, no, Dr. Did Trump. you abuse the child so Absolutely there would be abuses, not. Uh, bruises that you could... Absolutely not. ...put on them? No. So do you think these two are lying to you? No. I, and I don't think they're lying to me because there was a second abuse allegation the day that they came to... where the SWAT team came to get um, <coughs> Conrad from my house. Mm -hmm. And, the, and they, the sheriff officers were inside my house and they took... Um, as Shannon put Conrad into the car seat and got things ready, they played with Conrad. And they took him out to the car and they, and they handed him over. And then they drove 80 miles down the road and claimed that Conrad was what, crying what? so uncontrollably that they had to call an ambulance. Mm -hmm. What happened? Now, Sam, what happened? you were in the car. No, you know no, no, he hold was on, crying. hold on, let me talk. Because what happened was she walked into the bathroom of a McDonald's. He was totally fine to change his diaper. He came out hysterically crying. That is not true. That is a you fact. know it. That he is was a crying. Fact. You he was know that. He was crying uncontrollably after, after about came out of the 15 minutes in the car. He woke up and he started no. crying uncontrollably. No. We stopped at McDonald's to change his diaper, no. hoping that he That's was not wet. True. Yes, that is that true. Is I'm having a hard time understanding. You three are contradicting each other, and then you act like you're not. I don't understand. You say you think she trumped this up in order to get custody. Did you not hear them say that no, they were running to her with the baby, saying, please but, take the baby? Right, but they were running to her because she, she had flown to, to um, Kansas to be with me, and she trumped up those charges on, on abuse to have him taken back to Illinois. Had she not done that, she would have been in a supportive home with somebody who would have taught her how to be a mother and okay. who would have helped take good care of her. But did there you... There was no reason for D DHS or D DCFS. Did you not see the living conditions? I was, how do you have an I infant was, in those conditions, Deanna? Because those Deanna? conditions did not exist when I was up there. I was up there. You were my, there my, two days before that. Exactly. And, and they that's what that I'm saying. Nasty. That's it what I'm saying. It was that nasty. I don't and you know said you, nothing. No, it wasn't that nasty. Well, do you think those pictures were staged? I do. I think that she oh took my God. them before oh they cleaned out that property. They don't... They don't even say they were staged. Well, now, now listen. See, that's no, the thing. You see, guys need to go backstage and get your story straight. They're telling me that they asked her to take the baby, that she didn't right. trump something up. They're saying they went to her and said, we're not ready for this baby. We can't take care of this baby. I've got postpartum anxiety. Right. I don't know what to... Will you please take the baby? Temporarily, but will you please take care of this baby? Except right. I never would have asked her to had DCF not been involved and had they not come to Kansas and taken him from me in the first place. You're telling me you didn't know it was permanent custody? You sent your own mother a text saying you're giving permanent custody to her and she's chewing your butt out for it. Thursday on an all-new Dr. Phil. Tell me what happened tonight that Chrissy went into the coma. The last time viewers saw Nick Gordon. I miss Chrissy and Whitney so much. <laughs> Dr. Phil arranged for rehab. Bobby Christina Brown, the daughter of the late music legend Whitney Houston, has died. Now, the autopsy results are in, and Nick Gordon sits down to look Dr. Phil in the eye. I want to give you a chance to set the record straight. The exclusive interview. 
But that's the lowest point in my life right there. When you left money in the will by Whitney, photos surfaced of Chrissy smoking out of a bong and snorting cocaine. Did she have a drug problem? Yeah, it got really bad. Were you a bad influence on her? They say he punched her in the face and kicked her to the point she was on the floor screaming and you dragged her up the stairs by her head. And the question everyone wants answered. Did you murder Bobby Christina Brown? That's Thursday. There was an appearance and consent to guardianship that were signed by Sam and Shannon on 11-8-2011. Sam and Shannon claim they were tricked into signing over guardianship, but here is a document that shows both of their signatures on the appearance and consent to guardianship. An entry of an order of guardianship as prayed may be made by this honorable court. Okay, now both of you signed that. Yeah, but the, the fact that we gave her guardianship is not what we are saying we were tricked into. What we're saying we were tricked into was the fact that it's a permanent guardianship and not a temporary one. Well, so two weeks later, this, this wasn't like you just went in and maybe, okay, we're young and stupid, we didn't read it. Two weeks later, they sign again on November 23rd of 2011, this time the order of guardianship. Kimberly is appointed guardian of the person in a state of, and we've taken the name out, but it's the child, you, you went back in and signed again. Yes, but we didn't know that it was supposed to say something different. We don't know legal jargon, so we didn't know it was supposed <clears throat> to say temporary guardian. Well, really, because you then got an email from your mother on the 14th mm -hmm. in between these two that says, you tell me that you're going to give me temporary guardianship of Conrad only to notify me the next day by blanking text that you're giving Kim permanent custody? That's you. I don't... Hmm? That's... That's you yeah. Yeah. to yeah. your daughter. Yeah. You're upset because you sent her a text telling her that you're giving permanent custody to her. And you're telling me you didn't know it was permanent custody? You sent your own mother a text saying you're giving permanent custody to her, and she's chewing your butt out for it. We didn't know that it was permanent custody until Apparently after you did. Was, you told your mother. Until after everything was already signed. No, that was between the first and the second time. No, it wasn't. Yes. The appearance consent to guardianship was signed by you and Sam on the 8th. The order of guardianship was signed by you and Sam on the 23rd. So the 8th and the 23rd. Mm -hmm. Between those two, you and your mother are going back and forth on the 14th. So on the 14th, you get the text from your mother that says, Are you kidding me? You tell me by text that you have given permanent custody to her? I don't remember it, so... I mean, it's, it was definitely a conversation we had, and I had concerns, and I, was, I spoke with you about, like, not doing permit, doing temporary. That's why I wanted you to have your attorney to represent you to protect your rights and his, him to have his attorney to protect your, his rights, as, as well as you having your attorney so that if this guardianship was placed, that everybody was protected in it. And it wasn't Kim that comes up with a SWAT team and storms the house. It was Kim and Sam. Mm-hmm who you had placed a TRO on at one point, and he also sent a text to his mother. Mm -hmm. You sent, you and your mother are going back and forth on text. Sam and his mother are going back and forth on text. And in one text, he says, you were right, Ma, the whole time. I'm the one that's sorry for not believing my own mother. Now she's going to get him back. Kim, no, she's not going to get him back. Sam, she's just a nutcase. <laughs> that was a year ago. We were in a big fight at that time. Couples argue, I, I get that. Yeah. But y you guys understand here, I I'm looking at this to see, I always look at what people say then versus what they say now. 
It's he and his mother that come up and take the baby. And then he's telling his mother, uh, listen, you were right. She's a nutcase. I was really mad at her at the time. Yeah. And I reached out to my mom because I hadn't talked to her in a while. Over a year. Yeah. Next, Shannon says if she really was a bad mom, the state would have taken her other two children. Kim says no matter what Shannon or her fiancé have to say, they're not getting Conrad back until they meet her demands. Does she have that right? And what are those demands? We'll talk about that after the break. Tomorrow on an all-new Dr. Phil. Human remains found in a recycling bin. Accused of killing a mother of three. You say he choked you. His ex-girlfriend speaks out. He put on your undergarments? That's tomorrow. Shannon and Sam say Kim is evil because she refuses to give up guardianship of their five-year-old son. For the last four and a half years, Kim has been raising her grandson because she says his parents are unfit to do the job right. They agree they were unfit way back, but they say it's a different time now. Kim's daughter, Allie, says her nephew should stay right where he is, living with her and her mother. Shannon and Sam think that they're great parents, but they're really not. They're very inconsistent. Shannon and Sam are constantly coming in and out of Conrad's life. The two of them have a very unhealthy and toxic relationship. There is a lot of yelling between them. The two of them cheat on each other. Last year, my brother called my mom and said that they were sleeping in separate homes. No child deserves to be around that chaos. My mom provides everything for Conrad. He's got food, he's got shelter, he's got love, he's got security, he's got trust in the people that he's around. You're like Superman! They don't give her a dime. Mama. Conrad loves her to death. I know that when he gets older, he'll look back and appreciate it. As of right now, I think it's the best thing for Conrad to stay with my mother. If Conrad went to live with Sam and Shannon, he'd probably have a horrible panic attack. He doesn't know them. He's used to being around the people that he's used to being around. You rip a child from that, it's gonna break them. Shannon and Sam, you wanna be near your child that bad? Move to where he is. Allie, thank you for joining us. You're around this child every day. Yes, for the most part. And how's he doing? Wonderful. Mm -hmm. He's a great kid. He's got pretty much everything he needs. Mm -hmm. How would you describe his personality? Uh, kind of like me, outgoing, <clears throat> but at the same time very shy. Mm -hmm. So when he's in one of those moods where he wants to show his new stuff off, he'll take his trucks and show everyone. Mm -hmm. But shy at the same time. And how are they doing as parents now? Right now? Uh -huh. Terrible. How do you know that? With Conrad, terrible. With their girls... I was out there in December because I just wanted to see my brother. Mm -hmm. And from what I saw, the attention that they give them, great. Um, Living-wise, it's a step up from how they used to live, but it's not the best. But you saw pictures before where things were pretty grungy. I've been in it. I've seen but inside of it. things have improved. They've improved from that, yes. Right. So when they say that things are better, like their living conditions in 2011 were pretty bad versus 2016. Uh, See that, that couch? They provided and those all pictures, that stuff. which certainly show a different story now. Uh, is that a fair representation or? I mean, their kitchen didn't look like that. It was a normal kitchen. had food, you know, on the kitchen and plates and stuff, dirty dishes yeah. in the sink, that's normal. But their living room, I mean, it was, they had broken crayons and food all over the ground. Well, they say for the, the last two years that they've been living in a two-bedroom house, which is neat, clean, and well-kept for the most part. Uh, you say they're attentive to their, to their other children? Yes. And... I wasn't there to judge them. I was there to see my brother because that was... You didn't come out of there saying, oh, my God, these children are being neglected. No. No indication of that? No. Uh-huh. Now, you have a list of demands for them. How do you guys feel about that? 
Some of these are new, like the joint custody thing is new. Do you need Dr. Phil's help? Text Phil to 88500 and share your story for a chance to appear on the show. Standard message and data rates may apply. I'm 100% ready and able to be a good mother for Conrad. When I first had Conrad, I was young, I was dumb, I had no idea what I was doing. Today, I'm in a much better place. I have a house with my two beautiful girls. Sam and I have been together and stable for more than two years now. I went to college just so that I could be a better mom. I took early childhood education classes. I even went to counseling per Kim's recommendation just so that I could be ready for Conrad. We're happy, we're ready. Conrad needs a healthy, stable, consistent environment and I don't feel that he'll ever get that with Sam and Shannon. Why did you take those classes? They're um, early childhood education classes uh -huh. because I wanted to be able to be a better mom. Uh -huh. Were you aware that she'd gone through this coursework and completed all this stuff? She provided it to the court last year when we were in Yeah. Litigation. So that's certainly steps in the right direction, right? Yes. Now you have a list of demands for them before you would even consider giving their son back. One is move back to the area where you live, because you're not going to become invisible in this child's life no matter what, right? Correct. Become a stable presence in their son's life. And you would say you want psychiatric evaluations for Shannon and will not give custody if she's bipolar. Um, she's never she was, I'm, I'm not her bipolar, mother, bipolar. Her mother sent me an email back in 2012-ish and uh, said that Shannon had been diagnosed with bipolar and um, Well, was you're not suggesting that bipolar folks can't be parents, are you? Uh, no. If she is and she refuses to take medication, that's a problem. Let me assure you, there are uh, thousands and thousands and thousands right. and thousands no, I know of that. bipolar parents sure. in this country that are doing a wonderful job raising children. That, that mm -hmm. doesn't, you can't exclude, <laughs> that's ridiculous. Uh, individual and family counseling. You would want them to get some help. Sam must go back on his ADHD medication and be cleared by a psychiatrist. Shannon and Sam must submit to drug testing. Reunification counseling. Needs to feel comfortable with Shannon and Sam as parents. Uh, that's pretty subjective. Wants joint custody with Shannon and Sam. They would be primary. Uh, must agree to stay in the area until son is 12. Uh, Sam evaluated for drug and alcohol addiction must be free of drugs for a year. And how do you guys feel about that? Well, I haven't done any drugs in a long time, so... So that would be easy. <laughs> Most of the list is actually done. Um, some of these are new, like the agreeing to stay in the area until he's 12, that's new. Um, the joint custody thing is new. I've been cleared of my ADHD, so that's not even an issue. Yeah. Okay, well, let's, well, we need to take a break, care. and then we'll talk about this. Next, does Kim, in fact, have all the power here? Is she the only one who can determine if Sam and Shannon are fit to be parents? We'll talk about that when we come back. Sam and I have been engaged for a long time. We do not want to have a wedding unless we have Conrad back with us for good. The whole point of getting married is to start your family, and we can't do that without our entire family. I would definitely like for my mom to be at the wedding. I don't want her in the same state as me, let alone my wedding. If they get married, all hell's gonna break loose. They've been saying they were getting married for six years now. They won't get married. Ready to get real? Go to DrPhil.com for advice on relationships, parenting, finances, and more. Plus, weigh in on your favorite episodes, share your stories, and find support in the Dr. Phil community. When you sign up for the community, you will automatically be subscribed to the Dr. Phil Show newsletter. Log on to DrPhil.com today. Uh, Deanna, did you want to say something right before break? I cut you. You look like you were... Well, it's just like there's always this have them move back, and I understand that would be the most ideal situation for Conrad, but it wouldn't be the most ideal situation for their two daughters. We just can't just think that it's about this one child because it's not. There's three here. That's, that's a very fair statement. One thing we have to understand and keep uppermost in our mind here is that as adults, we are fiduciaries. 
we have to keep the children's best interest at heart. So what needs to happen here, I mean, I'm, I'm troubled by the fact that you haven't seen your son in two years. There's no excuse for that. And if, if the two of you want to have a role in this child's life, um, you're going to have to start doing it in a stepwise fashion. Mm -hmm. And I will get you professional help to create what is actually going to be co-parenting. Mm -hmm. I'm going to I'm going to get you some help for the I, I'm going to get you a reunification counselor that will set up a plan to do this that puts the child's interest up here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then we start working our way and hopefully it can get to the point where maybe the child spend summers with you guys, maybe a, a couple of weeks, a couple of times a year where you meet halfway in between and you do things where you have a healthy relationship. But that is something that is gone in a stepwise basis that you're comfortable with mm -hmm. and you'll work to want to be comfortable with that in the child's best interest. But we'll get a reunification counselor that's our gift to y'all to work towards this. Thanks. You know, you want this child to have a relationship with his mother and father, right? Absolutely. But, and it'll, and this, this person will help you guys make sure that your home is like it needs to be, that your mm -hmm. priorities are where they need to be, and then we'll, we'll work our way up to this, and then the child has everything it could possibly want under the circumstances. If, if I get you that counselor, will you, will you do that? Yes, and, absolutely. And, you know, be gracious. This is your son here. I know. I miss him. It begins here. Put your agendas away. Put this child's agenda first. All right, I want to thank all of my guests today. We will see you next time. Thanks for being here. I'll get you some help with this. Okay, Allie, thanks. Okay, thank you so much. All right, man. Yeah, thank you. Right, thanks, guys. Dr. Phil. Human remains found in a recycling bin. The man accused of killing a Seattle mom. I remember saying to myself, I'm not surprised. His ex-girlfriend speaks out. You say he choked you. He put his hands around my throat and squeezed. The shocking photo. Do you know if that's the only time he ever put on your undergarments? The exclusive interview. He left behind a blanket. My daughter sleeps with that blanket. A blanket from a man accused of murdering and dismembering a mother of three children. Plus, I encountered one of the most serious serial killers, and I lived to tell about it. She stared serial killer Ted Bundy in the eye. Nobody has ever heard your story before. Until now. We're back at this spot where this horrible thing happened. He leaned in really close. I thought that he was going to kiss me. Her terrifying ordeal. He probably strangled me to unconsciousness five or six different times. He said very quietly, do you know what? I'm going to kill you. I thought I was going to die right there in the car. But he had other, other plans. He said, don't die on me yet, because you would miss the best part. Today, with two television exclusives, here's Dr. Phil. It's a shocking, gruesome murder that left many on edge. Ingrid Lyne, a beautiful mother of three, leaves for a date to a baseball game and is never seen again until her head and body parts begin appearing scattered across Seattle. Bombshell tonight. A mom of three dips her toe back into the dating scene. It all ends in tragedy. A disturbing discovery in Seattle Central District. Suspected human remains found inside a recycling bin. That missing mom found dead. Her remains wrapped in plastic bags and, quote, still fresh. Police are working with just a few disturbing clues. Pieces of Ingrid carefully wrapped and stashed in recycling bins. A 15-inch pruning saw in the bathroom of her house, blood and flesh inside the pipes underneath her bathtub. 
In my experience, we're looking at one of two things. A serial killer who gets real joy about doing this, or perhaps she was murdered during a very vicious argument. Now he's got a dead body. What does he do with it? He cuts it up and he distributes all over Seattle, thinking that she won't be identified. Ingrid's mother looked up a recurring phone number on her daughter's phone and found it belonged to John Robert Charlton. She sent a text to the number saying that she had called 911. He wrote back, 911? What's going on? We went to the Mariners game last night, but we didn't stay the night together because she has her kids today. Ingrid's mother replied, she's missing. What time did you see her last? A police officer needs to speak to you as you may be the last person who saw her. The minute that she mentioned, you need to speak to the police, the conversation went cold. Big red flag. We used some forensic evidence dealing with uh, telephone calls and cell towers. By utilizing those, we were led to a suspect. The man she'd been on a date with Friday night is in jail, suspected of murdering her. Seattle police says it's digging into Charlton's background, which it suggests includes a history of violent crime. This heinous crime has everyone wondering how and why. Today, speaking for the first time in an exclusive interview, we are talking to a woman who believes she knew John Charlton intimately. When she read the headlines, she almost threw up and thought Ingrid Lyne could have been me. Here's my exclusive interview with Heather Danishevsky. This is a tale of this innocent woman being murdered and then dismembered. How did you find out about this this gruesome murder? I just happened across a news article and it, the name John Robert Charlton popped up and I was like, oh my goodness. So I started reading it and I immediately went into shock. I got sick to my stomach. I couldn't even speak. When you read that, did it strike a chord within you that said, I can believe this? Oh yeah, definitely. I actually remember saying to myself, I'm not surprised. Because you understand, we're talking about somebody that murdered the mother of three, allegedly, dismembered her body, and scattered it around. Now, he's not admitted that. Right. And so we have to say that. But what in your experience made you say, I, I believe it? Well, he's very charming, witty, very smart. But I could tell that there was something about him that just was off, maybe a little mental instability. Um, there, there was just a, there was a dark side to him. I tell him, there, there is something scary about your eyes, something mysterious and just off about your, your eyes. And he's like, don't say that. Now, how long were you in a relationship with him? Roughly six months. We started seeing each other December of 2012, and I ended it August 2013. When you first met him, was he clearly trying to get in a relationship with you? How it happened was we were working together, and we started hanging out and got into a relationship, and uh, we were kind of together off and on during those six months. Was he attentive? Was he loving? Was he... Very much so. I remember when we had first gotten together, my daughter was really sick, so he actually um, came and visited us at the hospital, brought me food. I was starving, brought her a teddy bear. So he moved in with you and your daughter? Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. And when he moved in, was he comfortable to be around, living together 24-7? Yes and no. After, after he did move in, I kind of noticed I felt like I was walking on eggshells. He kind of gave me the sense sometimes that everything I did wasn't good enough. I didn't want to do anything that would be wrong in his eyes. And when you did something that was wrong in his eyes, how would he express that? It was almost like he gave me a lecture, you know, because he was a very black and white thinker. It's either this way or this way with him. And it was hard convincing him otherwise. So he was, like, he was a difficult person. We, we did argue. We fought a lot, actually. And how did that go? A lot of the times we did argue was alcohol involved. When he drank, he became a completely different person. He was mean, stubborn, bullheaded. He was never violent, like he never hit me or anything like that. It was mostly just emotionally, just really, he'd really get inside your head. So alcohol changed him? Oh, definitely. And how often would he drink? 
Um, more than he probably should have. I mean, he was on probation at the time. And he was on probation for what? I believe it was for a theft that occurred in Montana. Okay, and, and he told you about that, yes. right? And he told you it was about stealing a purse? From a breastfeeding woman. She was breastfeeding her baby and he stole her purse. What did you say about that? Because it seems to me like that's kind of really a pretty low life thing to do. It is very much, yeah, very much so, but. How did you make that okay with yourself? I like to see the best in people. I like to see potential in people. And it did seem like he was trying to make things better. You said he wasn't violent, but you did say he choked you. He did one night. I know it was a night we had gone out and we were drinking and then it turned into us being sexually active. And during it, he put his hands around my throat and squeezed and it scared me because he kept getting a little harder and harder and harder to the point where it got harder to swallow it was getting harder to breathe and then if I remember right even after we were done we were dressed he then again put his hands around my throat and did the same thing and he said you're going to fix this you are going to fix this as he has his hands around my throat I actually got really scared I was like is he going to stop is this going to escalate further there's a million things going through my mind did this scare you the same as when he did it during the sex? Hey, during the sex, I thought it was just maybe, you know, like, you know, some people are kind of weird like that. Then when he did it, when we weren't being sexually active is when it really started to scare me. And that's when, you know, the thoughts are racing, like, is he going to stop? Am I going to have to defend myself? You had said that he seemed to enjoy hurting you. It's, it's almost like it gave him a sense of authority, like a sense of power to constantly be lecturing me or telling me things should go this way or things should go that way. It seemed like he thrived on making people feel bad, like pointing out their flaws. So this incident that you're talking about was before he moved in with you? If I remember right, yeah. How did you categorize this in your mind that you made it okay for him to move in with you and your daughter? This is a guy that's demeaning you then he's choking you to the point that it's scaring you is this going to stop and then you say yeah get your stuff and move in how did you make that make sense okay, i was young at the time i was 24. i was smitten with this guy i mean he was very good looking very smart and then of course i told myself maybe if he just stops drinking you know it won't happen anymore did his probation officer find out he was drinking? Yeah, he did, actually. I remember... How did he find out? Uh, we went out for Valentine's Day. We were drinking. And I think it was my landlord. He swears up and down it was me, but I never did that. He thinks you called his probation officer and said he's drinking in violation of probation. He needs to go yep, to jail. Yeah, he did. He did. He spent like four or five days in jail. You're talking about Valentine's Day. There's an interesting picture that you gave us that. Yes. Was he drunk in this picture? No, no, this is when we were getting ready to go to the restaurant. So this is before you went out? Yes. So he's not drunk here? No, just goofing off. That's one of our very few fun moments we had together. How did that come about? I honestly don't know. I just remember walking out of the bathroom and he just started posing. I was like, okay, I gotta get a picture of this because this is hilarious. Do you know if that's the only time he ever put on your clothes, your undergarments? That's the only time I'm aware of, yes. This is the day that wound up getting him arrested for violation of probation and put in jail. Uh-huh. Okay. It comes where you do break up. How did that come about? It just, it got too much for me. It's not healthy for me. It's not healthy for my daughter. So a couple weeks go by, and um, they get a text. He's like, so uh, how are things going? What's going on? I'm like, you know... I'm spending more time with my daughter, and I don't think I need you in my life anymore. And that was that. And I had not heard from him since. When you think back now that a man that is allegedly capable of doing what you now have read about was sleeping in the same bed with you, was sleeping just feet away from your daughter, how do you react to that now? Coming up. My daughter was very, very attached to John. He left behind a blanket. Even to this day, she sleeps with that blanket. How do you feel about your daughter having a physical attachment to a blanket from a man who's accused of murdering and dismembering a mother of three children? And later. 
She survived an attack from serial killer Ted Bundy. So at this point, you think, I'm going to have to fend off a romantic advance. Yes. He leaned in really close. I thought he was going to kiss me. Instead, he said very quietly, do you know what? I'm going to kill you. Tomorrow. My daughter pretends to be a cheerleader to catfish boys. You posted, are you ready for a hot bod? Here we come, cheer king. Well, I don't remember doing that. Is this the face of a pretty little liar? I found Ryan soliciting sex for money on Craigslist. I was never going to sell myself for money. I'm at my house and no one's home. Then you include a picture that we can't show here. Then on Thursday, the daughter of Whitney Houston has died. The autopsy results are in, and Nick Gordon sits down to look Dr. Phil in the eye. Did you murder Bobby Christina Brown? All new Dr. Phil. That's Thursday. We now return to a beautiful mother, dead and dismembered. The ex-girlfriend of the man accused speaks out. Charlton has a criminal past stretching across six states. But a protection order petition from 2006 stands out. His father reported Charlton took the movie Hannibal from his shelf and showed it to his mother, telling her she should watch it and, quote, beware. Ingrid Lyne was reportedly dating John Charlton for just over a month. They were still relative strangers. How much did she really know about him? Did Ingrid know he had a lengthy criminal history? He has convictions for misdemeanor assault, misdemeanor battery, felony theft, and second degree felony and aggravated robbery. When you think back now that a man that is allegedly capable of doing what you now have read about was sleeping in the same bed with you, how do you react to that now? Makes my skin crawl. It makes me sick. I regret not saying anything to anybody. I didn't even tell my own mom. I mean, the least I could have done was tell somebody, his probation officer, anybody. Just, I mean, I know that it might not have made a, a difference or an impact in what happened with this woman, but at least it would have been on record. And how old was your daughter in 2013? Four or five. Does she know what has happened with him now? Yeah, she was very, very attached to John. I mean, even after we had split up, he left behind a blanket. Even to this day, she sleeps with that blanket. It is her favorite blanket. I know when I'm scrolling through Facebook, she'll, you know, she'll be sitting by my side and we'll look at pictures and she goes, Mom, is that, was that John? I'm like, yes. Well, what's going on? You know, I explained he had badly hurt a woman. She's not here anymore. And I remember her asking me, she goes, Mommy, are you sad? I'm like, yeah, I'm very sad. Because she had three little girls of her own. How do you feel about your daughter having a physical attachment to a blanket from a man who's accused of murdering and dismembering a mother of three children? Her attachment isn't as strong as it was, say, a few years ago. I mean, now she just acknowledges that, oh, yeah, that's the blanket John gave me, and that's that. I mean, she acknowledges, she goes, John did a very bad thing, and he's kind of a bad guy now, huh, Mom? I'm like, yeah, he, he's a very bad man. Well, I'll give you a piece of advice you didn't ask for. You might want to get her a new blanket. I think I might. It can be very confusing to her because the older she gets, the more aware she's going to become right. of what he's accused of doing and what he may be convicted of doing. And if she finds out that she's drawn comfort from something that is attached to someone that allegedly has been involved in that kind of horrific conduct and behavior, it's very easy for her to say what's wrong with me that I have felt this emotional comfort or attachment. So you might take her out of that position just when she's gone to school. Most definitely. That just might not be there when she got and that's, back. That's fine with me. That is absolutely fine I, with I'd, me. I'd really you protect right. her from herself on that because she, she doesn't know. I'm so glad to be talking to you right now. We always say hindsight is 2020. You would do things very differently today oh, than most you would then. And I'll leave you with this thought. The statistics are that the frequency of abuse of a child when a non-biological male is in the home is 33 times normal. 
what it is if you don't move that person in. And I tell you that to think about going forward. Most definitely. We need to be really careful and thoughtful about who we expose our children to, certainly who we let into our home Most definitely. to become part of the fabric of their lives. I know a few of my family members are really upset with me learning about this man, John, because I would invite him to family functions. My family would invite him. He never wanted to go. He never wanted to be around them. I think it's really important to decide before the charm kicks in. Most definitely what discontinuation criteria are because you saw something wrong about this guy then you knew this guy stole a breastfeeding mother's purse and you saw that he changed when he was under the influence but the charm had set in because love is blind and it can really cause you to overlook some things i think you've helped some people to think twice about what they do Thank you so, so much, much for talking thank to you us. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate me here. it. We reached out to Gordon Hill, John Charlton's public defender. He did not return our request for comment before our broadcast deadline. In published news reports, he has said that there is absolutely no forensic evidence linking Charlton to Ingrid's murder, and he has denied his client's involvement in this heinous crime. And let me be very clear while John Charlton has been charged in connection with her death, it is still early in this case. He hasn't even entered a plea yet to the crimes he is charged with. He is scheduled to be in court tomorrow. Coming up. A woman who fell prey to a handsome, charming, and murderous man. For decades, Rhonda Stapley didn't tell a soul that she was kidnapped and almost killed by America's most notorious serial killer, Ted Bundy. Today, she's finally breaking her silence and telling her story. He put his hands on my throat and started squeezing. I thought I was going to die right there in the car. That's next. My mom says I have a mental disorder. <laughs> you guys said she ripped the wings off of a pet bird. I did not kill my bird. You little witch. Your children have been removed from the home. I'm in Hollywood right now, so how can I worry about my children? I've been worried about your children. Why don't you take them, then, little witch? Ah. Off before I hit you on stage. They believe a stranger is obsessed with their twin daughters. She took my photos offline and made up a complete lie of her as their mom. My girls are in picture frames all over her house. How did hundreds of pictures of their twins get on your Facebook page? I honestly don't know. You're a damn liar. You've claimed my girls as your own girls, and it's gonna frickin' stop. He was a major league pitcher. Now his family says he's a drunk. You've been self-medicating with alcohol because your dream got ripped from you. I'm not a drunkard. This is that bottom of the ninth, man. You got to do this. The Dr. Phil Show now continues with another exclusive interview. Ted Bundy is one of America's most infamous serial killers, dubbed the Lady Killer. One of the most famous psychopaths in Utah's history is Ted Bundy. The serial rapist and murderer was captured and caught here. The good-looking, charismatic Bundy admitted to killing at least 30 women. But some say he could have committed a hundred or more during his reign of terror. A judge in Miami today followed the jury's recommendation and sentenced Theodore Bundy to die in the electric chair for the murder of two co-eds. It is hereby imposed the death penalty upon the defendant Theodore Robert Bundy. But there was one secret victim, one who got away, one who has never told her story until now. Rhonda Stapley was a young, innocent college student when she accepted a ride from a handsome stranger. When she got into his old Volkswagen, she had no idea she was sitting next to America's most notorious serial killer and was about to look death right in the face. Nobody in the world has ever heard your story before. Tell me how you encountered Ted Bundy. It was October of 1974. I was a, a pharmacy student at the University of Utah in Salt Lake City. I was at a city park waiting for a bus to take me back up to campus. The bus was late. I was getting frustrated. And then this tan Volkswagen drove by very slowly. 
cute driver kind of looked at me as he went past and then he stopped and backed up and leaned over and rolled down the passenger window and asked me where I was going. I told him I was going up to the U and he said, me too, hop in. So I opened the door and got in. The first thing that I noticed was the inside passenger door handle was missing and he leaned over and pulled the door shut, but I wasn't alarmed. I figured college kid, college car, things fall off. How does he look to you at the time? He looked like a college student. He was dressed nice, had a green pullover, sweater on, nice slacks. And you say, okay, because he looks like the fabric of the university community. He didn't look like an outsider. He didn't look like we would think about a predator. Right. So you drive off, and what was his demeanor? Lighthearted. We just had the normal conversation that strangers would have. I told him, my name's Rhonda, and I'm a pharmacy student. What are you studying? He told me his name was Ted, and he was a law student. In a, just a couple of blocks, he turned a way that wasn't the normal route to the university. And I asked him about that, and he was very polite and asked my permission if it would be all right if he took a little detour. He told me he had to run an errand up by the zoo, and I told him that would be fine. I didn't care. I thought I would still be home faster than if I had waited for the bus. And then we went right on past the zoo, and I said, hey, I thought we were taking me to the zoo. And he said, no. I said, near the zoo. That road goes over the hill and drops down into Parley's Canyon, which is the main highway back into the city. Nothing's gone off in your head yet? Nothing's gone off. We're just having fun. We get to the bottom of that canyon, and we should have turned right to go towards campus. And instead, he turned left and started driving up another canyon. And as he's driving, he's kind of looking at parking places and side roads. The conversation started to go weird then because he stopped talking to me. And I'm still trying to make idle conversation. And, and I'm thinking that he's probably looking for a place to pull off and park and wants to make out. And, I don't know him, and I'm not really a makeout person, but he's still a cute law student, and I don't want to offend him, and I don't want to embarrass myself. So I'm thinking of, how do I get out of this situation? And then he pulled into a parking place and, and parked the car and turned it off. So at this point, you think, I'm going to have to fend off a romantic advance. Yes. And then he turned in the car seat, so he's kind of facing me, and he leaned in really close. I thought he was going to kiss me. Instead, he said very quietly, do you know what? I'm going to kill you. And he put his hands on my throat and started squeezing. My first thought was, it has to be some kind of a joke. This guy's got a weirdest sense of humor. But that was just maybe a fraction of a second because I realized he was squeezing too tightly. He was serious, and I was in trouble. And there's no door handle. What did you do? We had a little small battle in the car, but I went unconscious. So he choked you to the point of unconsciousness? Yes. Did you put up a fight? I did as much of a fight as you can put up when you're running out of air. Did you think at that point? I'm going to die. You think I'm dying in this Volkswagen bug right here? I thought I was going to die right there in the car, but he had other, other plans. Coming up. He said, good girl, good girl, don't die on me yet, because you would miss the best part. Thursday, Nick Gordon returns. Well, you left money in the will by Whitney. Photos surfaced of Chrissy smoking out of a bong and snorting cocaine. Did she have a drug problem? Yeah, it got really bad. Were you a bad influence on her? They say he punched her in the face and kicked her to the point she was on the floor screaming, and you dragged her up the stairs by her head. And the question everyone wants answered. Did you murder Bobby Christina Brown? That's Thursday. We now return to Handsome, Charming, and Deadly. I escaped serial killer Ted Bundy. In the tapes made available this weekend, Bundy tells of a murder and describes himself in the third person. He placed his hands around her throat just to throttle her into unconsciousness so that she wouldn't scream anymore. We're back at this spot where this horrible thing happened 40 years ago. Coming back feels kind of creepy, 
I didn't really remember the sound of the water until we came back here. I remember it clearly now. There was a picnic table in this area. The Volkswagen was parked in that area over there. Then he turned off the lights. We were sitting in the car at the time. He strangled me unconscious. I thought I'm gonna die. I am really gonna die. So I just came to on the picnic table. So you go unconscious. You wake up on a picnic table. Are you near the car? Probably about 30 feet away from the car. OK. Do you know how much time has transpired? I don't. I woke up. He was slapping my face like they do on the movies when they're wanting to wake somebody up from being drunk or something. Mm -hmm. And then he pulled me off the picnic table and was slugging me in the stomach. I was doubled over on the ground, begging him to stop. Were you screaming and crying? Yes, and, and begging for my life. I was um, telling him, don't, don't hit me anymore, you know. And he's hitting you in the stomach? I'm losing my breath. I'm almost throwing up. I'm worrying that ribs are breaking and stuff, possibly. OK, and so now you're on the ground. Now I'm on the ground. And he sat on me, on my stomach and chest, mashing me so that there's no air. And I said, get off. I can't, can't breathe. And he said, you have to relax. And if you stop struggling, I'll let you breathe. And so I held still for a minute, and he did let me breathe a little bit, kind of scooted back on me so he wasn't smashing me so much. And then he um, put his hand over my nose and mouth and cut off my air. And I passed out again. And he sort of enjoyed just watching me die. He would do that over and over. At one point, he asked me, how would I prefer to be strangled? How would I prefer to suffocate? Would you prefer it like this? And he put his hand over my nose and mouth again. Or is it better for you like this? And he put his hands on my throat again. I just thought I was going to die. And how many times do you think he took you to unconsciousness and, and then brought you back? Probably at least five, maybe six. Really? And did you get the sense that he knew how far to go without killing you? Yeah, I think it was a game. And then what happened? The last time as I was coming from unconsciousness to consciousness lying on the picnic table, he was slapping my face again, trying to wake me up again. And he said, good girl, good girl, you don't want to die yet. Don't die on me yet, because you would miss the best part. And he grabbed me by my boot to the end of the picnic table, pulled my pants down, and raped me. And just as that was finishing, he leaned forward again and put his hands around my throat. and was choking me again, and at that point, I, I, I didn't struggle. I decided I was dead. I was just going to wait until it was over. When he raped you, was he quiet? Was he talking? He was, he was silent. All I remember is his eyes were just black and evil. The next thing I knew, I was laying on the ground, and I was sort of surprised when I came to again. And it's pitch dark, and he was standing by the open door fiddling with something in the back seat, like 30 feet away from me. And I didn't really plan anything like a great escape, but adrenaline was running, and I just jumped and ran. I didn't run very far because my pants were in a wad around my ankles. I tripped after just one or two steps, but fortunately or luckily or intervention from above or something, I fell into a fast-moving mountain river that swept me away from my attacker and probably saved my life. Coming up. How far did you fall before you hit the water? Six feet. Face first? Yeah. I'm feeling like I'm drowning. I was being smashed into big boulders, tree limbs, and I thought that I was still going to die. Tomorrow on an all-new Dr. Phil. My daughter pretends to be a cheerleader to catfish boys. You posted, are you ready for a hot bod? Here we come, cheer king. Well, I don't remember doing that. All-new Dr. Phil. That's tomorrow. We now return to Handsome, Charming, and Deadly, a Dr. Phil exclusive. Ted Bundy is one of the world's most famous and studied serial killers. He was a kidnapper, a sadistic serial rapist, a torturer, a murderer. And it's the way he went about those murders that is so disturbing. He probably strangled me to unconsciousness five or six different times. 
The last time I woke up, I was on the picnic table. I came to and you can see a little light coming from the dome light of the car. He was probably looking for the crowbar to make sure I was dead. I just thought, run. I was still lightheaded from being unconscious. I didn't notice that I was running towards a river and a cliff instead of towards a forest. And the next thing I knew, I was landing in ice cold, stop your heart cold water, which was sweeping me away from my attacker and probably saved my life. At the same time, I thought I'm still gonna die. I encountered one of the most serious serial killers and I lived to tell about it. How far did you fall before you hit the water? I think it's probably about six feet. I kind of scooted, slid down the embankment and landed. Face first? Yeah. This is October, right? It's got to be cold. It, it was like stop your heart coldness water. Just all of a sudden I'm in the water. And I'm, I'm not feeling safe yet. I'm feeling like I'm drowning. I was being smashed into big boulders, tree limbs, and forced under bushes and stuff by the force of the water. I thought that I was still going to die. You ultimately stopped against a grate, right? Some yeah, type of some kind of a metal grate to catch tree limbs and debris going down the river. How did you get out of the river? I climbed out with the use of the debris as kind of a little stepping stone. Your pants are still around your feet. Still around my feet. And yeah. so you get your clothes back on as best you can. Do you have any shoes on? Yes, I was wearing brand new hiking boots that day and wrapped the laces around my ankle about three times and double knotted them. And that's probably why that he couldn't get them off and neither did the river. Now you've climbed out of the river. Do you have any idea where you are? I know that I'm about four miles up the canyon. So I followed the river and just walked out of the canyon. I was terrified. I thought he would find me and if he did, he would stab me or choke me or run over me or... You thought if you got on the road, he would come driving by? He would, yeah, that's and, what and I thought. And find you, so you stayed? So I stayed right along the riverbank. God, I'm proud of you. God bless you. Okay, so you get back to civilization. Where did you get to ultimately? I walked all night to my apartment on the university campus. You walked a hell of a long way. Yes. After being horrifically brutalized. Were you still worried he would find you? Yeah, I was ducking behind trees, and whenever any kind of car would turn toward me, my heart rate would go up, and I would just know I was going to die. Is it still dark when you get home? It's starting to get light. When I got to the bottom of campus, kind of on my turf, and I'm feeling more empowered and more anger than fear at that point. So you go to your apartment. Where are your things? I had a backpack uh, with my driver's license and student ID, stuff like that. And the backpack I had left probably still in the Volkswagen. He had your name? Had my name. He could have found me if he had wanted to. So you make it back to your apartment. What did you do? Showered, got out of those clothes and bathed, drained the water and bathed again. And then I slept. I was exhausted. You wake up later that day. Thinking I've got to, I've got to do damage control. I've got to get my river ruined clothes off the bathroom floor and I've got to put on long sleeve shirts and I've got to cover my bruises because I don't want anybody to know that this has happened. Tell me, what's your 21 year old mind telling you that you have to hide this? I'm feeling shamed. I'm embarrassed. I feel stupid for having even gotten myself into such a dangerous situation. I should have known better. I thought that if my mother found out, she'd make me drop out of school and go home. I imagine people pointing at me and saying, that's that girl that was raped. How did this sit with you across time, living with us alone? I, I hadn't dealt with my own, my own emotional pain. And then the news was reporting that other people were missing it. They were finding bodies at the canyon. And every time that happened, I was feeling guilt about all those other women. That if I had come forward, maybe he would have been captured. I had all this nervous energy right after that. I was total insomniac, so I would put on my clothes and go running in the middle of the night. Do you know why you did that? I think I was trying to run away from myself and try to run away from remembering. It's just a, a way of coping. As people value their lives less, we tend to see them engage in high-risk behaviors more. Yes. It's like, yeah, I guess I could get killed, but... What could they do to me that hasn't already been done? How did you feel when he was arrested? Coming up. When I saw him on TV, that's when I knew that he was my bad guy. And I knew their monster was my monster.
return to Dr. Phil's exclusive interview, I Escaped Serial Killer Ted Bundy. Pensacola, Florida police are questioning a man they say may be one of the worst sex murderers of all time. He has been positively identified as business capee Theodore Bundy, a suspect in the rape murder cases of at least 36 young women in California, Washington, Oregon, Utah, Colorado, and Michigan. How did you feel when he was arrested? When I saw him on TV, and then I knew his real name was Ted, that's when I knew that he was my bad guy, and, and I knew their monster was my monster. You know why he didn't lie about his name. Because you weren't intended to leave that. Parking lot. Didn't matter that you knew his name. Mm -hmm. What do you see when you look at that face now? What a waste. His whole life was about hurting people and causing pain and suffering. And he looked so normal. When you got married, and started a family. I mean, what did you say to yourself? Well, I thought that it wouldn't really be possible. But then I met my husband. I told him that I had been raped. He said it didn't matter, and he didn't ask for details, and I didn't offer any. He accepted me for who I was. You made a beautiful bride. Thank you. <laughs> we had two daughters together, lots and lots of pets. I had a career as a pharmacist. Um, life was good. Tell me about the process you went through in deciding to write this book. What happened is I developed post-traumatic stress disorder. And I started having flashbacks and memories and panic attacks and nightmares. And being a victim is a very lonely feeling because you feel like you can't really tell people. And nobody would really understand because nobody has experienced what you have. How dark did this get for you in the aftermath? Very dark. The darkest was probably when I realized that all those other people may have lived if I had come forward, I realized now through therapy I don't need to feel guilty about that because he was Ted Bundy and he would have killed people whether they were the Utah people or, or not. How bad did the guilt get for you? I self-medicated. Uh, at one point you overdosed. Yes, right after his escape, his first escape. Was it intentional? Yes. I don't know if I really wanted to die or if I just wanted to stop the pain. If you could talk to 21-year-old Rhonda, knowing what you know now, what would you say to her then? Ready to get real? Go to drphil.com for advice on relationships, parenting, finances, and more. Plus, weigh in on your favorite episodes, share your stories, and find support in the Dr. Phil community. When you sign up for the community, you will automatically be subscribed to the Dr. Phil Show newsletter. Log on to drphil.com today. If you could talk to 21-year-old Rhonda, what would you say to her then? It's not your fault, Rhonda. And you are the same person that you were before. Um, you're not damaged and you didn't ask for it. Um, you're not stupid. She deserved better than she got in the parking lot and she deserved better than she got in the years that followed. True? True. And you're still here. I am. I know that if we suffer in silence, then it just becomes penalty. But if we create meaning to our suffering, then it becomes tuition. We get something out of it. And there are thousands upon thousands of 21-year-old Rondas, and they're hearing you now. Maybe it gives them the strength to report something and keep someone else from falling victim. That's why I said I'm so glad that you're here and so glad that you've written this book, and I want everybody to read this book. Rhonda, thank you for telling your story. Thank you. I want to thank both Heather Danishevsky and Rhonda Stapley for sharing their stories today. It takes real bravery to come forward and talk about things that perhaps are easier to leave buried. All women should use these stories 
as teaching tools to keep themselves safe. It's about trusting your gut instinct and hopefully by hearing these stories, that gut instinct will be razor sharp. Rhonda's book is called, I Survived Ted Bundy, The Attack, Escape, and PTSD That Changed My Life. Her book comes out in May. I wanna thank Heather for sharing her story. Our thoughts and prayers are with the family and friends of Ingrid Lyon, mother of three, tragically taken far too soon.